feeling. How are you feeling? Oh, feeling fine. Thanks. Okay, good. Yeah. All right. Well, I see we're live. So uh, let me um, uh, one and all again to the um, uh, continuing uh, public hearings of the Transportation Committee. I'm the chair, Kumar Barve. I'm joined by Vice Chair Dana Stein uh, and, and the members of my committee. And let me just begin, as I always do, by uh, announcing the order of the bills this afternoon. First bill will be 857, Delegate Lehman. Uh, second bill, 991, Delegate Gilchrist. Third bill, 992, Delegate Gilchrist. Fourth, uh, House Bill 1025, Delegate Terraza. Fifth, House Bill 1069, Delegate Stewart. Uh, sixth, House Bill 1094, Delegate Ruth. Uh, seventh, House Bill 1103, Delegate Wyville. And then the final bill, will be House Bill 1133, Delegate Bridges. And so all sponsors get um, four minutes. And um, Delegate Lehman, the floor is yours. Uh, start us off, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, good afternoon, um, Mr. Chair, Vice Chair, and colleagues. For the record, Delegate Mary Lehman presenting House Bill 857, a bill requiring owners and manufacturers of synthetic turf and turf infill to report tracking information to MDE for publication on its website. The bill will create a repository of information about where synthetic turf fields are located in Maryland and when they are moved, where they go. Synthetic turf has been growing in popularity for decades. That popularity has led to increased installation by public and private schools, colleges and universities, recreation departments and other entities. Despite its widespread use, there are virtually no laws or regulations nationwide about turf reuse, recycling, repurposing, or disposal. After two prior attempts to legislate disposal, I am taking a scaled back approach with HB 857 that I believe is a modest but important first step at creating transparency around synthetic turf and turf infill use and disposal. The bill does this by requiring two categories of reporters to communicate to MDE about where fields currently exist in Maryland and where they go when they are moved. So um, the two types of reporters are for synthetic turf and turf infill installed prior to January 1 of 2022, it will be the owner of that field that is the reporting agency. Think school system, parks and rec department, municipality, etc. Um, for synthetic turf fields installed after January 1, 2022, the producer slash manufacturer of the turf in, uh, field and infill is the reporting agency to MDE. The major difference between HB 857 and the previous turf disposal bills I introduced is this bill is not prescriptive. Um, the purpose, again, is to create a repository of information on a public website about synthetic turf. It does not attempt to prescribe the ways in which the carpet or the infill can or should be reused, repurposed, um, or disposed of. It only says that information must be reported to MDE. Mr. Chairman, there are multiple amendments to the bill, but most of them are clarifications that were requested by the owners and by MDE. I consider those friendly amendments. I accept them. I did initiate two changes to the bill. First of all, I dropped a requirement um, at the very end of the bill that says the MDE must approve reuse of a field. And secondly, I added penalty language for failure to report to MDE. Uh, the bill uses penalty language from sections 9334 and 9344 of the environment article. First is a written warning, and then um, second, there is a possibility of fines, but that's at the discretion of the attorney general. This is the same penalty language that is used in Delegate Stewart's driveway sealant bill. Uh, the turf industry opposes this tracking, despite the fact that it encourages its own members to establish a chain of custody system. I um, uploaded a copy of the industry's 2017 guide with its chain of custody recommendations. A quick comment about the fiscal note. I thought the original version, version so misinterpreted the bill. I did ask that it be rewritten. I am grateful that request was granted, and I think the cost to reporters will be nominal. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I want to finish by saying I really believe that this chain of custody bill is workable for both owners and producers. I think it's a significant first step. Um, in creating transparency and accountability around where turf and turf infill is within our state's boundaries during any phase of it. <clears throat> Thank you for your consideration and I urge a favorable report. 
Uh, thanks a lot, Delegate. Um, the following people have been signed. We'll, we'll go through all the proponents and then we'll entertain questions. Uh, the following people signed up in favor or favorable with amendments, and they are in this order, Martha Ainsworth, Neil Seldman, Peggy Dennis, Diana Conway, Amanda Farber, Carol Falk, and then Bill Tyler and Michael Riley are signed up favorable with amendments. So why don't we start with Martha, Neil's on deck, and we'll just go through that. Every, everybody has two minutes, and then we'll entertain questions. So uh, Martha, uh, welcome back to the committee. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman Barbe and committee members. I'm Martha Ainsworth, Chair of the Maryland Sierra Club Zero Waste Team, speaking on behalf of more than 75,000 members and supporters of the Maryland Sierra Club. We strongly support HB 857. The bill addresses the serious waste problem posed by the lack of transparency and accountability for disposal of synthetic turf and turf infill. Synthetic turf sports fields, which have an average eight-year lifetime, produce a huge volume of waste. An average sports field is 80,000 square feet and comprised of 40,000 pounds of mixed plastic turf and 400,000 pounds of infill, usually tire waste and silica sand. Um, where is the used synthetic turf going when this life is over? We actually don't know. There's no documentation of the extent of reuse, repurposing, recycling, and ultimately the disposal of this waste. We don't even know how many synthetic turf fields have been disposed of in Maryland or will be in the future. The Synthetic Turf Council guidelines point to the landfill as the ultimate destination for synthetic turf, but it takes up a lot of space and landfills like the one in Prince George's County won't accept it. The guidelines also say that incineration is not an answer. In fact, millions of square feet of synthetic turf end up in rural and urban stockpiles or dumped in the environment, sometimes in sensitive ecosystems or vulnerable communities. The Synthetic Turf Council's guidelines already recommend maintaining a chain of custody, but accountability for proper disposal depends on public information. They must be informed. This bill will document and make public the number of installations, the extent to which Synturf is reused, repurposed or recycled, and how it's disposed of. It will incentivize, we believe, proper disposal and hopefully serve as a deterrent for dumping. The Sierra Club respectfully requests a favorable report. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, we'll uh, listen to Neil Seldman with Peggy Dennis uh, on deck. Neil. Is Neil Seldman there? Okay, we'll go straight to Peggy Dennis then with, uh, if, and with Diana Conway after her. And if Neil pops up, we'll, we'll take him at the end of the propo uh, proponent. Peggy, you out there? Okay, we'll go to Diana Conway and then we'll take Peggy if she pops up later on. Okay, uh, can you guys hear me okay? Uh, good afternoon, yep. Chair Barve and the committee members. I'm speaking on behalf of the Women's Democratic Club in Montgomery County in support of 857 as a WDC priority bill. The bill injects light and transparency into the sometimes shady corners of a staggering waste problem, old synthetic turf fields. Each one amounts to 200 tons of mixed plastic waste with 40,000 shredded used tires per field. Bill asks two simple questions. When did you become the owner? And where did your field go when you had it removed? The logical place to get those answers is from the owners in sequence. As a matter of logic, it is perplexing that the industry's lead trade group, Synthetic Turf Council, opposes this measure because the same SDC has recommended for years that its members in fact implement chain of custody certification and the website still says so. Their own president, from whom you'll hear shortly, uh, extolled just last year to your friends at ECM how enthusiastic he and his, his members would be for such uh, guidelines to be put into law. But as a matter of politics, the incoherence here is not surprising if you consider the political minuet that they've been involved with in Maryland since 2016. That's the year Delegate Mary Washington asked their designated hitter if there's lead in their product. After some hemming and hawing, he finally conceded, yes, there's lead in our product. And for five years, this industry has been too busy to, co to coherently rebut or even clarify the statement. Then in 2017, their guidelines for this chain of custody went up at their website and on their printed material, and they're still there. Then in 2019, my friend Delegate Love asked SCC President Bond if there were any laws or regulations on disposal, quote, not to my knowledge. 
Then in 2020, last year, Mr. Bond extolled to your friends at ECM how great it would be if only people would do the, uh, the chain of custody and talked about the Montgomery County field that was going to Malaysia and for profit was going to somehow come back as plastic uh, fencing. These fields are not turning into plastic fencing. Instead, they are a waste problem. They need to be managed with transparency and accountability. Ask me a question about the fiscal note. Thank you. I'm sure somebody will. Uh, Amanda Farber, and then Carol Falk. Amanda? Okay, uh, please unmute yourself and what? Yes, I'm here. I can hear you and see you. Welcome to the committee. Great, thank you so much. I'm gonna share my screen. Uh, have we arranged for that ahead of time? Uh, yes, I did request. Trish, you ready for this? Well, apparently, well, go ahead and try it, I guess. Uh, hmm. Well, okay. Can you see it? Yeah, I can even see myself speaking, so uh, go for it. Okay, great. Good afternoon. My name is Amanda Farber. I'm a parent and volunteer with Safe Healthy Playing Fields, a national nonprofit. Recent news coverage has highlighted the growing problem of artificial turf disposal. But I have also seen the issue for myself, personally observing dozens of artificial turf field installations and removals. There are many unanswered questions and a history of misleading claims by companies and industry reps regarding the disposal and recycling of the materials that make up their product. This bill would provide basic accountability and transparency for an enormous and challenging end of life disposal issue. The Synthetic Turf Council is the largest industry association. And so you would hope they would want this accountability and transparency too. In fact, their own guidelines recommend chain of custody and even offer examples of how it can be done. STC president, Mr. Bond, has stated that these guidelines provide best practices for the industry. However, at a hearing of this, in front of this legislative body in 2019, Mr. Bond testified he was not sure how many of their members actually follow the guidelines. From what I have seen, I have to seriously wonder as well. In 2020, at another hearing, Mr. Bond promised full chain of custody for the plastic field removed from WJ High School and shipped to Malaysia. Now, one year later, there's still no documentation posted, no address provided, no post-consumer product, and no consequences. And the company is no longer accepting old turf. There's a reason this bill has support from a broad range of organizations. Industry guidelines do no good on paper if there's no incentive to put them into practice. For that to happen, regulations are needed. Chain of custody reporting is not a burden. In fact, according to the industry, it is a best practice. Maryland can be a leader on this issue with this bill. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Next, let's uh, go to Carol Falk, followed by uh, Bill Tyler and Michael Riley. And okay, thank you. And thank you, Chairman Barb, especially for this. Oh, my screen just went bananas. Hold on one second. I just lost my. We, we can see you. I know. I just lost my screen for reading my testimony. <laughs> I don't know what just happened. Can you just go to the green uh -huh. and click that again. Okay, here we go. Um, West Montgomery County Citizens Association is a civic organization founded in 1947 that works to help protect neighborhoods and green wedges, preserve stream river valleys, and monitor development in the Potomac subregion. WMCCA strongly supports HB 857 to require manufacturers and owners of the synthetic turf and turf infill industry with the Maryland Department of the Environment disclosing the owner and location of the field and infill. Roughly some 40,000 scrap tires go into the making of each synthetic turf field, along with hundreds of tons of mixed plastics. That means each synthetic turf field that is either carted off to a landfill or dumped at unmarked locations contains tens of thousands of pounds of plastic material containing PFAs 
um, which you I'm sure have heard about, polyfluoral alkyl substances and other harmful chemicals, in addition to hundreds of thousands of pounds of pulverized infill of tire or other plastic. Every year, more than a thousand of these synthetic turf fields have to be ripped out, the typical lifespan eight to 10 years, and disposed of according to the Synthetic Turf Council, the industry's leading association. The SDC estimates that 80 million square feet of plastic carpet weighing 40 million pounds and 400 million pounds of infill, usually made of tire waste, has, and it all has to go somewhere. The disturbing fact here is that no one is monitoring, much less regulating where this used synthetic turf field is going when it's removed. Several municipal solid waste disposal facilities in Maryland have said they would not accept used synthetic turf waste due to the weight and volume that are associated with a single playing field. In addition, recycling facilities in this country have rejected synthetic turf fields and infills because it's usually too expensive to separate the materials. That means these chemical laden plastic carpets are either being incinerated, repurposed, or dumped in ravines, deserts, woods, and empty lots. And that's according to the warning investigative report. Dumping often happens in lower income communities. Am I out of time? I'm afraid so, yes. Okay, well, you get the gist of it. Uh, I appreciate your time. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, next, let's, let's go to Bill Tyler and Michael Riley, and then hopefully Neil and Peggy Dennis will show up. Uh, so uh, Bill Tyler with uh, Park and Planning. Bill? Okay, how about Michael Riley? Um, is Michael Riley with us? Okay. It has Neil Seldman, have, have either Neil Seldman or Peggy Dennis shown up? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Michael Riley just popped up in the waiting room and I let him back in. Okay, let him, uh, let him in. Mr. Riley? Mr. Riley? Is he in the waiting room? He's in he be connecting. <clears throat> I am. Riley. I am okay. here. Can you hear me? I can hear you and see you. You have two minutes. Welcome to the committee. Thank you very much, Chair Barve and committee members. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Mike Riley. <clears throat> yeah, please proceed. Uh, I'm Mike Riley, director of Montgomery Parks, part of the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission. However, do you have YouTube on? I do. I, Please turn let that me off. leave. I apologize. In the meantime, Peggy Dennis or B Bill Tyler around? Muriel, uh, start up the timer again when he gets back in. Mr. Yeah. Chairman, I'm told that Peggy Dennis is with us somewhere. I'm not. She she is in, in the meeting. Well, Peggy, would you like to unmute yourself and testify, please? Because once we go to questions, I'm not going to permit any testimony. I see her, she just appears to be on the phone. I don't know that she knows she's in. Uh, Mike Riley? I do, the... I do apologize for that. Am I good to go now? You are right now. Um, please proceed. Okay, good afternoon, Chair Barve and committee members. I'm Mike Riley, Director of Montgomery Parks, part of the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission. However, today I'm here to testify on behalf of MACO's uh, affiliate for Maryland's County Park and Recreation uh, Departments, including Baltimore City, uh, known as the uh, Maryland Association of County Park and Recreation Administrators, uh, AKA MACPRA. Uh, MACPRA is pleased to support Bill 857 with two amendments uh, noted in its written testimony from our president, Steve Miller, the director of Wacomico County Recreation, Parks and Tourism. Uh, my friend and counterpart, uh, Bill Tyler, director of the Prince George's- hey, listen, could you, just, could you just get to the testimony and, um, 
and what your amendment would do because uh, you minute 15 left. Uh, sure. Um, we support the bill with the two amendments and the two amendments deal with the removal of the uh, approval process by MDE and then the language in the bill to make it simply a bill where we are required to report on uh, the inventory, what we have on the ground uh, in our fields around the state, and then uh, what happens when they are disposed of, reused of, or recycled, so that there's clarity in um, where these products are going at end of life. I really do wanna thank the sponsor, uh, Delegate Lehman, for reaching out to both MACBRA and the commission to get our insight as owners of these fields and for uh, listening to our, our concerns, but we do support the environmentally responsible disposal of the components of these fields at their end of life. Uh, before I go on to any other uh, witnesses, uh, Mr. Riley, do you know of any uh, individuals in any county or Baltimore city who have a position like yours, who, who, who you know of who disagrees with uh, your position? Well, I'm stating the position today of MACPRA, and okay. we do have the state. Uh, uh, I cannot say it's every meeting. We have every county represented, but no one objected to the position I just read. Okay. The reason I asked you that was only because I cut you off and you were listing all the people who you said were with you. So I just wanted to give you an opportunity to clarify that. Uh, thank you very much. Okay. So uh, are either Neil Selman, Peggy Dennis, or... Um, Bill Tyler around. I'm here. Can you hear me? I can now. Uh, uh, welcome to the committee. Oh, I don't know if you can see me, but I cannot see my testimony because technology and I do not get along well. Well, I can but, see you. Okay. Thank you very much. I'm testifying on behalf of the Montgomery County Civic Federation. For years, we have been looking for su and supporting bills that would put some kind of constraints on artificial turf playing fields and playgrounds. This is such an important topic because these turf, artificial turf fields and playgrounds are so toxic, so enormous in terms of bulk and weight. Every single one is a brown field that the future should not have to cope with. Having a chain of responsibility or chain of reporting is certainly a step in the right direction. And we're very thankful for Delegate Lehman for introducing this bill because for years we've been told that we couldn't do anything to constrain artificial turf fields because the PG delegation would object. So thank you, Delegate Lehman. This is a big step forward. I'd like to say, if these fields are not constrained and the schools and playgrounds, recreational facilities that they have to be taken out of when they've reached the end of their life cycle, if we, the public, have to pay for the disposal of these fields, it's $130,000 thousand dollars plus transportation and disposal for each field. That's an enormous bill for the taxpayers to have to fit foot. So please send this bill forward with a positive, favorable recommendation. It's time we did something to constrain these fields or at least set up a chain of responsibility. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peggy. Uh, if Neil and um, Bill Tyler are not available. I'm just gonna to proceed to questions and I think. Uh, this is Bill Tyler. I am available, just got in, thank you. Okay, go, go ahead, welcome to the committee. You have two minutes. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon, and my name is Bill Tyler, Director, Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission, Department of Parks and Recreation, Prince George's County. And I wanna thank you for the opportunity uh, to speak today. On behalf of uh, Mr. Raleigh, Director, Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission, Montgomery Parks, and myself, a sincere thanks to Delegate Lehman uh, for introducing House Bill 0857. Director Raleigh and I had several engaging and productive and informative conversations with Delegate Lehman, and we're most appreciative for being, being included in the collaborative discussion and development of this impactful bill. Uh, Bill 0857 is a great start for transparency and accountability for producers, contractors, installers, and owners 
for the disposal of reuse of the synthetic turf components. The commission sees a role for synthetic turf, although some may differ, uh, and we see common ground that disposal or reuse should be publicly disclosed. As you may know, our mission is to, is to be great stewards of our natural resources, and we believe this is an important step to help protect the environment and aid in this, this stewardship. The commission fully supports with amendments, uh, Bill 0857, and urges a favorable report. Thank you. Okay, um, unless Neil Seldman's shown up, I'm gonna to go to questions. And I believe the first question, hold on. Um, uh, Mr. Chairman, we did just let someone in from the waiting room. It could possibly be Neil Seldman. Um, uh, okay, uh, Neil Seldman, are you, uh, are you out there? Apparently not. Okay, so it appears the first question goes to Delegate Sheila Ruth and then Delegate Sarah Love in that order. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, Delegate Lehman, thank you for bringing this important bill. Um, I just have a couple of clar clarifying questions. First, I um, I thought I heard mention of amendments and, and I, I apologize if I missed what those amendments do. Uh, can you talk about that? Sure. So um, there are number of amendments that were requested by um, the owners, primarily um, those came through MML and, and MAKA wanting clarification around <clears throat> owners as reporters. And the request was to tighten or clarify the language so that it was clear that when ownership ended by one entity um, and began by another that the original owner no longer was the reporter. So think about a hypothetical situation would be if a, um, a public school or public school system is the owner of a given, um, synthetic turf field at one of its high schools and and the say the players kind of rebel and say to the school board, we don't want to play on artificial turf anymore. We want to go back to natural grass. And the school system says, okay, that's fine. We're going to have to find a new home for this. And the school system ends up either selling it or giving it away to say a private school or a, a private sports club of some kind. They want a clarification that at that point when there's new ownership, that they no longer, the original owner would be the reporting agency and would not have to continue to follow that field through the remainder of its life. So that is, that that constituted several of the, of the um, parts of the amendment. And then I requested proactively um, two changes. One was to take out a provision that said that MDE had to approve of a reuse of a field. So before a field was taken out, and, and that was put in originally um, because of the situation that you many of you have heard about that occurred a few years ago at Richard Montgomery High School, where a very deteriorated field was taken, rolled up, put on trucks, and, and brought up to a paintball field in Baltimore County. And, and you know, most people, reasonable people without any expertise in this um, area would have said that never should have happened. That was the purpose um, of that provision, but several um, uh, user or owner groups protested and said, you know, that, that could leave us with no plan B if we have good intentions with reusing a field. Um, you know, we could, we could get held up by MDE and MDE might not even have that expertise. I did not want that provision to become a red herring. I understood the concern, so I removed that. And then the other thing I did was to add the penalty language that I described. The bill originally had no penalty provisions and I had the drafter, you know, look throughout the environment article um, and she came up with the uh, provisions that ended up in Delegate Stewart's driveway uh, sealant bill, which it's a written warning um, the first time a, a party, an owner or a manufacturer fails to report. And after that, it, there is the discretion by the attorney general whether to fine a violator. Great, thank you so much. And I think your first amendment actually answers my question, but um, just, to, just to clarify, so if a school say, sells or gives away a turf field, then they only have to report to anybody that they sold it or gave it away and, and who they gave it away to. They don't have to set up some kind of ongoing tracking. 
They do not. They do not. After after the field, you know, changes hands um, in, you know, in, in the formal sense and physically gets moved, they have to report that that physical move, you know, where it went, who the new owner is. But that ends that entity's responsibility for tracking that field at that point. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Delegate Love. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm curious about the fiscal note. Could somebody address that for me, please? <laughs> I would I love would, the opportunity yeah. to do that, Delegate Love. Thank you so much. Um, I have good representation here in D16. Um, the concern is that the fiscal note that was delivered with this bill uh, seems to indicate that it's going to be terribly onerous and drive up the cost for small businesses. The, um, the, the problem with that logic is that if these um, existing small businesses involved in what would be a reportable chain of custody are behaving well now, they're already incurring those costs of their good behavior in the subsequent disposal and passing on of their field. And um, I can see how if they're not doing that, it might in fact be a drag to have to start reporting that you maybe are doing something that might not be um, quite as admirable. And so to correct that behavior would in fact probably be expensive. But isn't that the point of waste management is that we have transparency and accountability in the management of the waste. So for the good actors, there should be no penalty, no cost, no issue. And for the others, um, they need to possibly review their behavior and um, maybe find different solutions. I hope that answers it. It does. Uh, thank you. Th thank you for that, um, uh, Diana. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if I could briefly answer that as well and explain or expound on my testimony where I said I felt like the original um, uh, fiscal impact uh, statement of the fiscal note was so um, off the mark that I did formally, you know, in writing request that it be rewritten, that that either the original draft or, um, or someone else reread the bill and rewrite it because initially it indicated there could be um, you know, significant impact on owners, manufacturers, even small businesses. Um, sm small businesses are not even part of this bill. As I explained, there are only two reporting entities, owners and manufacturers. And so the, the note was rewritten and I believe it, it indicates that there could be a significant impact only in a situation where MDE has to approve the reuse. And that of course, was a provision I took out of the bill. So there is okay. no, or an instance where MDE has to sign off on reuse. Okay, Delegate Healy, then Delegate Clark. Uh, thank you very much. I just wanted to ask uh, the sponsor, Delegate Lehman, do you support the park and planning amendments or do they, or I mean, are you all on the same page now with them? Yes, absolutely. And I really valued their input. I've had, um, as both of them said, multiple conversations with not only um, uh, Mr. Riley and Mr. Tyler, but Adrian Gardner, who a lot of you know is general counsel. And um, uh, Maryland National Capital Park and Planning actually took this up at a meeting a week or so ago and, and formally voted to support the bill. Um, and their requests were around, um, primarily around ownership. So yes, I do. I, t I totally am on the same page with uh, Maryland National Capital Park and Planning. Okay, and they support your amendments and you support them? Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Delegate Clark, then Delegate Jacobs. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Delegate, uh, has there been a, any kind of a census taken to who actually owns the majority of these fields? Uh, are, they, are they owned by public uh, you know, government entities, you know, school systems and counties or as most of them owned by private schools. Do we have any idea? Um, no, thank you for the question, Delegate Clark. No, we actually don't, big picture. We don't even know from one county to the next how many turf fields are in the ground. And that is because there are so many different owners. Um, there's a growing sort of trend among public school systems, especially at the high school level, but I think increasingly even at the middle school level, um, uh, to, to purchase and install turf fields. And, um, you know, that actually began in Anne Arundel County many years ago. I, I believe it still has the most turf fields of any, any school system in the state. Um, all of its high schools have one turf field. Many of them have two and some have three. Um, but Prince George's County is starting to install more and more of them. I think we have eight in the ground and another half dozen or so in the pipeline. But there's also uh, parks departments, private schools, private athletic clubs, colleges and universities, 
it is a really growing exponentially. Okay, um, okay. but to answer yeah. his question, we don't is, know, but yeah, it seems no, mostly, but it seems no to be mostly, uh, schools. Yeah, so my question is, it, it seems like whatever cost there is will be coming back on the public to pay anyway, which, you know, because we, in Calvary County, we have one, and it's a private school. Our public schools don't have any. So we wouldn't really have any cost involved in this going forward, correct? Well, the, you know, I believe the cost of this bill as it's written should be nominal because, because all it is is a reporting requirement. As I said in my testimony, this bill does not attempt to prescribe what is or isn't a proper method of disposal. It is simply a reporting bill. It is creating the question you asked about, is there an inventory? There is no inventory. This is an effort to create an inventory of ownership and, and a, a chain of custody or a chain of movement that shows when a field is removed, where it's actually going. Okay. Hey, thank, you. thank you very much. Delegate Jacobs. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Delegate Lehman, there, is there any other states that do this? Um, the, this area is um, virtually unregulated across the country. The, the only regulations I'm aware of are in New York City, and those are, are regulations. It is not a law, and it is for the um, uh, Recreation Department of, of New York City, which owns several hundred turf fields. And what New York has done is created some regulations around procurement. So when they, um, when the city puts out an RFP for a turf field, it requires that bidders specify what they will do with their fields at the end of, of the, the life of the field after about eight to 10 years. That is the only thing we are aware of. There are a lot of jurisdictions trying to get their arms around this, but we do not know of any others that have, um, you know, any laws, whether it's chain of custody or disposal. So no other states that you're aware of? No. Okay. I'm just curious because the range of testimony, I'm just wondering if, if there was any anywhere else we could look to see how it actually played out. So that's the reason why I asked that question. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, any other questions for the sponsor or the proponents? I'm <coughs> seeing none. We'll go to the um, opponents, <clears throat> Dan Bond, Roy Littlefield, and Mark Rainey. Uh, Dan, are you with us? Yes, I'm right here, Chairman. Okay, uh, you got two minutes. Welcome to the committee. All right, welcome. Thank you so much. Um, just really quickly, thank you for the opportunity. Um, STC is headquartered in Maryland, uh, just north of Baltimore. Um, you know, there might have been some uh, misinformation there. You know, we're ready to work with Delegate Lehman in, in order to amend this bill. Unfortunately, we weren't contacted before this bill was dropped. So I don't know if there's an opportunity to do it during the amendment process or, you know, anything after that. But uh, unfortunately, we didn't have an opportunity to do it. There are a few troubling provisions in this um, that I wanted to address. Uh, and then maybe answer some questions that the delegates had for uh, Delegate Lehman that I might be able to answer as well. Um, you know, as a logistical issue, the manufacturer of the turf and the infill are completely different. Um, this bill would discourage, uh, as it's written, recycling, reuse, and repurposing a turf that's already taking place. For example, turf uh, that's received in rolls is processed into plastic pallets uh, suitable for injection molding, rotational molding, and profile extrusion. Uh, it would be extremely difficult to have a chain of custody on turf that's turned into another usable product uh, that's been recycled in this manner. Um, reuse of the turf field should be allowed without uh, request just because the, the field owner is the one that actually owns the field. It's pretty self-explanatory. Um, their reuse options that occur today include fields, tea mats, uh, golf products, and doormats. Uh, discouraging the use of uh, athletic fields uh, will negatively impact communities of color. Uh, these communities typically in urban areas have less space to promote uh, year-round enjoyment. Uh, a turf field can be used, uh, the average uh, field can be used three times as much as uh, grass. And so this needs to be taken into account where uh, areas where space is an issue. Uh, obviously the obesity problem in Maryland is very similar to that in the US as well. Uh, and then there's some stipulations on 5,000 square feet that I can answer later. 
Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Next, let's uh, hear from Roy Littlefield and Mark Ranny or Rainey will be on deck. Roy. Thank you, Chairman Barve and members of the committee. Um, I am here today on behalf of the Tire Industry Association. We're an international nonprofit association based in Bowie, Maryland, and we represent all segments of the tire industry, mainly tire dealers here in the state of Maryland. And we have 252 members here in Maryland and over 13,000 across the country. We have trained over 160,000 techs and we have remained very, envi very environmentally focused with our Environmental Advisory Council. When it comes to tire recycling, this is a great success story, not just throughout the United States, but especially here in Maryland. Past initiatives have helped clean up stockpiles, and we are one of three states that has actually cleaned up all our stockpiles. Um, in, in 1984, we were lucky to have at the time Congresswoman Barbara Mikulski looking out for our industry. Um, she was able to make an amendment to the 1984 Research, Resource Conservation and Recovery Act, which, which took um, tires away from being classified as a hazardous waste. Um, because of that, we, we've been able to create a great success story here in the state. And I would hate to see a bill do anything to, um, to change the existing uh, system um, that would hinder any advances that have been made in this area. Um, we, we believe that setting up a chain of custody system would create unnecessary burdens and, and unnecessary requirements. And there's also logistical and tracking issues with the bill. As a former athlete in the state of Maryland, um, I grew up in this state and uh, played three varsity sports in high school. And I can tell you as an athlete in this state, I always preferred playing on the turf fields and my fellow athletes felt the same way. We were often faced with um, grass fields that were very poorly maintained and I would hate to see a bill do anything to um, take away from the uh, turf fields in the state. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. And then we'll, we'll go to uh, Mark Ranny. Did I pronounce your name correctly? Yes, sir, you did. My name is Mark Ranny, and okay. I'm uh, vice president of Emanuel Tire Company. We are the largest tire recycler in Maryland in the Mid-Atlantic region. I also sit as chair of the Tire Recycling Division of ISRI, which is the Institute of Scrap Recycling Industry. I'm here in opposition of House Bill 57. Um, however, I, I have not also heard any of the amendments until just uh, jumping online here. But as the largest processor of scrap tires, uh, we do process over 18 million, 18 million tires a year and 64 years in business. And I've been with the manual tire for 27 of those years. It's important to understand that all markets are critical to any successful tire recycling program and to our business in particular. Infill is an important and positive revenue generating market in our industry, where most markets in our industry are not. They're negative markets, markets in which we have to pay to get rid of our product. Um, as stated in my written testimony, products manufactured from scrap are no longer waste. And as such, House Bill 857 imposes a chain of custody control mechanism that's not appropriate for a valued recycled commodity. Our business is an easy one. Uh, we support the state developing markets and help developing markets as we work toward that every day in our business and industry. Imposing a chain of custody requirement outside of the field and property ownership, I think is going to place an unnecessary burden on the state's program itself, as well as uh, the industry members trying to uh, keep a positive um, effect on tire recycling. So in my opinion, this bill will do nothing to positively impact the positive direction that we need to see our uh, industry move, it, move toward. And finally, stating RecycleRubberFacts.org is a website uh, that answers a lot of questions and can point to people in directions of uh, the viability of turf fields. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, okay. we're gonna proceed to questions. And I think the first question goes to Delegate, whoops. Uh, Delegate Ruth and then Delegate Boyce. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Littlefield, I, I appreciated your, your letter um, talking about the advances that, that uh, you know, your, your work in terms of recycling tires and, and, and you know, the, the work that you've done in terms of reuse and recycling. Um, do, do turf fields last forever? 
Um, no, they do not last forever, but um, we luckily have lots of different ways now that we can recycle them and repurpose them. And there are parts and components of those fields that can continually be recycled. Sure, sure. And that, and that sounds great. Um, but eventually you reach a point where parts of it are just wor worn out and can't be used into something else. You said parts can be recycled. Um, this, this committee spends a lot of time looking at, at waste. It's, it's a huge problem. And, you know, it, um, does, it, it, does it seem unreasonable to you that we would want to be able to know what happens to that waste so that we can make decisions in the future about how to deal with it? Um, I, I don't think that it's it's unreasonable, but I just think we need to write a bill that doesn't put unnecessary burdens on those owners um, in terms of more costs and, you know, potential fines. That's the first I had, I had heard of that today. We're always concerned of that um, with our industry. Um, sure. So, sure, I understand yeah, that, but there's there's now a warning provision, right? So the first yeah. the first. Chairman, is there is there an opportunity for, for me to talk? I, I represent the industry, so it might be better. I, oh, I was well, asking this. Well, I mean, I, I always allow anyone to answer if they oh, okay. answer. Yeah, I'm happy to help out any way I can. Go ahead. Go ahead. Ms. Oh, Ms. I, I'm Bond, just saying that. Oh, uh, yeah. The, the the opportunity there is for a large capital investment. These fields cost anywhere from eight hundred thousand to one point two million to install. So you're talking about a a substantial investment. So but that investment obviously runs its course. And so the opportunities to reuse and recycle and repurpose the turf into another usable product is one of the concerns that I have with the bill. Uh, like I said, I'm happy to work with Delegate Lehman. Uh, I unfortunately wasn't called before this bill was dropped. So it's, it's important, I think, to deal with some of the limitations that the bill as written is going to have on the recycling that's already taking place in the industry. Sure, and I really appreciate the work that you're doing, you know, recycling. Um, how, how often does this, cha this changing hands happen? How often do turf fields change hands? Like well, I mean, when a, when a field reaches the end of its useful life in one application, uh, it's very often that it's either re-put back into the field. For example, um, the recycled tires, they are sometimes cleaned, the sand and the recycled tires that's used as infill, which keeps the blades of grass up and protects the players when they go to the ground. It's very often recycled and it's cleaned at the field or in a facility uh, nearby and then put back into the field. The average cost savings for a field owner is about thirty to forty thousand dollars, which isn't a lot of money when you're talking about a million, but it can make a big difference when it comes to those types of options. So we view that as a win-win when it comes to taking a product, cleaning it, and reusing it in the field, and having the field owner save money on the next field that they install. Sure, absolutely. I, I agree. That sounds great. But I'm just concerned that I keep hearing that it's it's going to be such a burden, this reporting requirement. And I, and I actually do understand your point if it's completely turned into a new product, um, you know, where it's extruded, that that would be difficult to track because it's now something completely different. But it's, uh, uh, you know, I guess to me, it doesn't seem like a, an onerous uh, thing to have to report every if it five years or eight years or whatever. And so I'm just curious. Well, the onerous reporting requirements, it, it, the problem is, is that it's, it will discourage the reuse and recycling of those fields. Any type of additional reporting requirements for an end user could have that possibility. But when you set the limit at 5,000 square feet and above, that's gonna bring in some commercial and residential applications that I, I don't know if the, the folks that, that drafted the bill wanted to bring in. And so you're gonna discourage their use of, you know, the, the use of synthetic turf a, as a landscape application as well. So you're not just talking about athletic fields. I mean, the, you know, plots of land are 8,000, 10,000 square feet and a homeowner that installs it in their property will have an opportunity to bump up against that 5,000 square foot uh, limit that's set into the bill. Mr. Chairman, if I could comment on the 5,000 square feet, 
Uh, no, I, you know what? I think I'd rather go to the next uh, member okay. who wants to ask a question. And okay. you, if you'd like to ask a question, that's perfectly fine as well. Uh, Delegate Ruth, are, are you good? Uh, I'm, I'm done. Thank you so much, Mr. Delegate Boyce. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. And I actually, um, Delegate uh, Ruth and I are on the same subcommittee. So we do definitely think alike. And so she started my question, which I think is great. And I think I can pull on her her questions a little more and really ask about details. So I'm gonna put it out there and put many things out there. Past athlete, soccer, lacrosse, um, cheerleader. So I've run on uh, you know, the natural stuff as well as the artificial stuff. And I understand with technology, these things move quickly. So I wanna, um, Dan, I should start with Dan. If you can um, help me understand the, the, the answer, the questions that have been asked have not been answered. Tell me the actual lifespan of turf use, sport use of a turf. And then tell me then what is the extended life thereof in its recycled parts. So you talked about the infield, which I'm very uh, familiar with. If you know a, a regular field is has a life of, I don't know, 10 years, but then I can get a new field, but I can take the infield, clean it and use the infield pieces again. How many times can I do that before it gets to the end of its life? I think that's some of the questions um, uh, we're trying to, to get at to, to really understand the quote unquote recycling component that you're you're talking about. If you can help me with that, I'd greatly appreciate it. Sure, and, and I apologize if I haven't been answering the question. No, it's okay. It's um, how the question's asked, it's okay. So the, the, the short answer has two parts, one, the warranty on an, a typical athletic field is between eight to 12 years. So that's in its first stage. The short answer to your second question is it can be recycled into perpetuity. You can have multiple reuse applications. At some point, the, the, the turf itself is going to break down because much like a bicycle or a, a motorboat or a vehicle, you know, it has a certain lifespan but you can continue to either recycle or reuse certain parts of it in perpetuity based on what the application is. So if you reuse a, a field, you know, a, a M&T Bank Stadium, if they put in a turf field, they use it for one season, you know, uh, the players say, okay, I want a new turf field to the owner. They, they roll the field up and they donate it to a junior college. So that turf field has 10 years left. For other fields that are used, you know, for 10, 12 years, eight years, that can be recycled into, you know, profile extrusion, plastic pellets. It can be melted down into a, a shock pad, uh, which, as you know, as an athlete, allows for that bounciness when mm -hmm. you run along the field. Absorption, um, yeah. Yep. And then for infill itself, the sand and the rubber can be used, I think it's three times is the, is the best practice. Mm -hmm. So you can have a field with sand and crumb rubber infill, recycled rubber, you could clean it, put it back in the fields, clean it, put it back in the fields. With the, ex with the exception of some of them, as you mentioned, may kind of disintegrate, therefore you meet, may need to add some to it, right? And so this is- Yeah, there's compaction is what it's called. Okay. Um, and also too, I, and I wanna make sure that this is, is, the committee members know this, on the side of the field, there are containment systems that costs yep. 20,000, 30,000 US that can be installed that capture up to yep. 95, 96% of those little pellets, the, yep. the recycled tires. And so your kids, I've got two kids, um, you know, that, that play on synthetic turf fields. They, they play soccer and they come home and there's, you know, recycled tires. All over the those, place. Those containment systems capture 95% of those tires. Right, and that's for the runoff as well. Because I worked for correct, and it, it most mm -hmm. importantly, it protects the environment around the fields themselves. Okay, so uh, just one more follow up question, if you don't mind, Mr. Chairman. Yep. Um, um, so okay, so potentially in, per in perpetuity. So I guess my my question regarding the recycling and the reporting, I roll up the field. It's been twelve years. What is then your process? Then is it is it to find somebody to recycle it? Is it to put it in a stream of recycling where you say it's going to, um, where did he go? Mr. Littlefield, and he's gonna take 
50% of this stuff here. And then the other 50% is broken off into percentages and then it goes to different places. I think that's the question, at least for me, like if, if you're saying that this is potentially something that can be recycled potentially in, in perpetuity, the question then for me is, then how do you process the recycling? In other words, I roll up the field, it's been 12 years, we need a new one. Hmm. Tell me what that process looks for your company. Well, the answer is yes. I mean, all of the above. So you can, the recycling, the reuse, the repurposing options are all there based on the, the field owner and the condition of the field. So for example, a field that still has its life can be repurposed as an athletic field that's installed somewhere else. It can be recycled into, you know, plastic pellets. It could be reused as a as a batting. But you're saying that's yeah. left up to the owner of the field. So it's the onus of the whoever owns the field. So I worked for an athletic department, a college athletic department for 10 years. So it's up to that university to which are, what I think I hear you saying is up to that university to then put it in the hands of somebody who will either dispose of it properly or recycle it. Is that what yeah, I mean? Or they get money from another entity to sell it to their to, to that facility. Okay. So, so they have right. something so, of value that they spent $1.2 million on that right. the difficulty is telling that field owner, sorry, you know, you're gonna have to pay extra or go through a reporting requirement in order to uh, dispose of it the way that from what, the, from what the language in the bill says, it might put that type of approval process in the hands of the state as opposed to the owner. So the owner doesn't feel like they own the field anymore, something of value. Uh, so so would you be, and, and I would have to um, check with the bill sponsor, but it sounds like then the bill needs to say that the owner of the turf would then have to put it into a certain stream so that it doesn't end up in dump somewhere. Well, we'd have to we'd have to make sure that the opportunity to recycle it or reuse it or repurpose it, you know, create something of value, isn't limited for the field owner, the one that actually owns the field. So I'm happy to work with Delegate Lehman and you know her staff in order to put language in there that doesn't give the appearance that the state sort of controls the field after the field owner says, okay, I'm, I'm looking at new options for what, what I had in my, you know, as an athletic surface after I, I uh, pull it up. I certainly understand. But if you're saying that this is potentially could be recycled in perpetuity, I, I guess I, I kind of stand with the bill sponsor in that I want to make sure that it can potentially be recycled in perpetuity. And so I'm hoping that we can find a fix in that. Thanks so much. Thank you. Okay, Delegate Love, uh, Delegate Fraser Hidalgo, and Delegate Lehman in that order. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Bond, maybe you can uh, clarify something for me. I heard um, in your original testimony it sounded like you are not supportive of chain of custody. Is that correct? No, I didn't say that. I said we can't support this bill as written. So the difficulty that I had was that we weren't consulted before the bill was, was, was drafted and introduced. And so I would have liked an opportunity to do that. But no, we don't, we don't, we support chain of custody as a best practice. Obviously, um, I believe Diana Conway and Amanda Farber and others who have testified beforehand have referenced uh, STC's technical guidelines as well. So I appreciate them doing that. Um, but we do support chain of custody as long as it doesn't discourage the recycling, reuse and repurposing that's already going on in the industry. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Delegate David Fraser and I'll go. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, well, now I have two questions. <laughs> so why why is that, Mr. Bond? Why why don't you support it if it if it well, why I mean, wouldn't you why why wouldn't you support chain of custody? I don't I don't understand. Are you concerned that chain of custody is going to impact the ability of others to purchase the product? I apologize. Maybe I wasn't making myself clear. 
the bill itself as written will discourage, we believe, the recycling, reuse, and repurposing that's already going on. I don't necessarily, the SDC doesn't discourage chain of custody only in, in the sense that it, it would discourage the recycling and reuse and repurposing that's going on. So I'm happy to support chain of custody as long as the field owner gets something of value for the substantial investment that they've already made and their choice of repurposing, recycling, and reusing their field isn't left up to the state in some department that allows for them the approval or disapproval of whatever they decide to do with the field. Okay, and th the reason I ask is because it seems to me over the years from what I've learned ab about the fields is that it's, it's a substantial investment, not only to purchase the fields, but what you do with the fields when you're done with them. So that's why, you know, I'm looking at this, trying to figure out as we tackle this issue for year over year over year on the same kind of issue, like what, what do we do with the fields when they're done? So that leads me to my second question, which is where are they, where are they recycled or repurposed? Is there um, a company somewhere in Maryland? Where, where are these fields being rolled up and taken to be, recycled, reused, or repurposed? Well, Del, we get it. To, to answer your first, the, the portion of your first question, you know, I think you hit the nail on the head. The opportunities for the field owner to recycle and repurpose and, and reuse the fields, it's a substantial investment. And it's a substantial investment to, to install a field, to take it up and to install a new field at the end of its useful life. So my, my concern is with a field owner that might feel like they've lost the control of their investment and they have to put more money into an investment that they weren't necessarily considering to do. Uh, to answer your second part of your question, uh, that's the crux of the argument. There isn't one major way in which a field at the end of one life, uh, useful life is repurposed, recycled, disposed of, reused, it's not an overwhelming majority. So there are applications that are all over the place when it comes to the options that the field owner has in order to you know, find a useful life or dispose of the fields at the end of, uh, at the end of its first life. Okay, so it seems to me this is a little bit like the cart before the horse. So we've come up with a product that we don't have any way of really reusing or recycling or repurposing because there's no reuse, recycle or repurpose entity, company, organization that's actually going to reuse, recycle, or repurpose, repurpose this. And then I start thinking about the total externalities, and that is the total costs. Like, what are the total costs for, um, for these fields? And when I say total costs, I don't mean just to make them and then, you know, a company sells it and they're done. I mean, total cost to society to clean it up when it's all done. So if there is no recycle, reuse, or repurpose location, I'm, I'm at a loss as to figure out what do we do with all, all of this, you know, toxic type material that we can't reuse, repurpose or recycle because there's nobody to do it. I'm, I'm at, a, at, a, at a loss here. I don't know if you have an answer for that question. I don't know if the chair, uh, I'm, I'm trying to figure out like. Well, well, Dave, uh, let, let, me, let me try this before I recognize uh, the sponsor of the bill. Um, Dan, my understand, I haven't read the bill uh, this year, but, I gather from the testimony that the bill primarily requires the owner of the turf field to report what they do with it when they get rid of it, right? Is that what you read, Dan? It does, but the, the concern that I have is that the department where this program is housed has the approval authority of what the field owner can and can't do with the field. So that was, that's one of the concerns that I have. Okay, that well, you know, no, uh, yeah. before, before I recognize uh, Delegate Lehman, I, I have to ask this question because I work for a company that uh, picks up and disposes and recycles hazardous waste. And we have extensive chain of custody reporting in that. Um, and it hasn't really stopped anybody in the industry from, you know, uh, 
engaging in the industrial and medical applications that result in these hazardous and biological wastes. Why, why, why do you think that this kind of reporting would have a harmful effect on this industry when extensive chain of custody re reporting in the bio and hazardous waste industry hasn't had that effect there? Well, I think you're talking about two separate products. Yeah, so but we're talking about chain. I'm talking about chain of chain of custody. You're making the argument that this is an onerous chain of custody process that could harm the industry, and yet it's not anywhere close to being as intensive as a chain of custody that my company deals with. And I, I have to assure you, nobody has stopped. Um, you know, it hasn't stopped industry anywhere else in Maryland. Well, I think the bill as written, we have to focus on the language and the several provisions that I've already addressed in my written testimony uh, as well. You could you could reference that, too. I, I think there needs to be a change. Um, you know, like I said, I'm happy to work with the delegates office in order to provide future amendments to this bill. Well, well, the, um, the bill is the bill is the property of the committee and the subcommittee right now. So you would be dealing with us as a committee. But of course, sure. You don't work with the sponsor, who I'm going to recognize now because she's. Mr. Chairman, I finish. May I? Oh, yeah. oh, I thought I thought you were done. I, I was asking you for help. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, well, I did. I, thank you so I much. I thought I did a hell of a job, Dave. You did. You did. You did a great job. But it, it, um, it in in so doing, what that leads me to, and that's kind of pushing my second to, to kind of last question, which is. You know, without a chain of custody and without any idea, and, and you said there's no place that actually that, that it goes. So what happens to these, you know, mountains and mountains and mountains of of this turf all around the country? Like, so I asked if there's a specific location that it gets reused, repurposed or recycled and you didn't have one. So where is it now? Like, where do all these big mountains of these fields go? Well, I mean, like I said, they have different options. Some are disposal, some are recycling. But, but, some hold on, Mr. Bond, Mr. Bond, so. if you could just answer my question. I'm not asking about different options. Well, I'm asking, where are they I'm, now? I'm trying I mean, to I answer your question. There are some options, but like, where are they now? I mean, options are great, but if you can't actually use any of them, so where do they go right now? There's, there's multiple applications. There isn't a majority for one. So the, the idea that, you know, 80% of the turf goes to X, that doesn't happen. So the, the idea behind a chain of custody, as I mentioned before, we're not necessarily opposed to that. We just wanna make sure that it doesn't discourage what's already going on. It doesn't limit the field owner from feeling like they own something of value, which they do is a substantial investment. And some of the provisions that will unnecessarily pull in commercial and residential applications at 5,000 square feet. You know, if we, if we I, had Mr. an opportunity Bond, to make those amendments, Mr. Bond, okay, all due okay. respect, if you could just answer my question, I mean, it's, it's a great dance you're doing, but I really, I would just like an answer to the question. Uh, well, I don't understand why it's so hard to answer this question, Mr. Chairman. I will yield to you. I just, just for the record, I, I have yet to have an answer to my question. I see a lot of dancing, but no answer. Okay, I'm going to go. I'm going to recognize Delegate Lehman and. Uh, Anybody else wants to ask a question and then we'll be, we'll move on to the next bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So my question is also for Mr. Bond. Um, you know, frankly, I have not had a single constructive conversation with you in two years, which is why I did not consult you this year on this bill. Um, I think this scaled back uh, bill, as I said in my testimony, is a very important first step. It in no way, how, let me turn this into a question. How do you interpret yeah with what something that is a straight reporting bill as discouraging reuse and recycling the only provision you cited was where mde in the original bill was going to have to approve a reuse that provision has been removed which said and you might not have been aware of that in fairness that was an amendment but that has been removed the rest of this is as straightforward a chain of custody requirement as you can get I am aware that there are other chain of custody laws, but I think Delegate Barve articulated that much more clearly than me. I, I am not an expert in, in this subject matter, but I am aware that there are chain of custody rules that are far, far more complex than this. This is a simple reporting requirement. How can you possibly interpret that as discouraging all the many, you know, uh, 
innovative ways in which turf is being reused or recycled. It, it certainly is not meant to do that. And I am willing to talk to you offline about your ideas, but this bill is, I consider it not only straightforward, but, you know, uh, uh, I mean, just just what, what you see is what it is. There, there are no hidden traps here. There are, you know, are no gotcha kinds of, of provisions. And it doesn't give MDE any authority. I, I said that it's not prescriptive where it says this is not an acceptable reuse or that is not an appropriate repurposing. Um, that landfill fill. Well, is let's let uh, Mary, let's, yeah. let's let answer. Thank you. Well, Delegate Layman, I appreciate the opportunity to meet with you and your staff. I'm, I'm sorry that you didn't feel like the conversation was constructive. Um, you know, I would have liked the opportunity to talk with you before this bill. Um, you know, the, the short answer is the STC supports, as a best practice, chain of custody. The bill as written has several provisions that may be a concern to the industry and in what's going on right now. I'm happy to work with you and your staff in order to address those amendments and the opportunities that we have in order to uh, make uh, your bill a, a better bill and one that works for the industry. And, and I think I mentioned this when I drove to Annapolis to meet with you and your staff. We're, we're trying to do the same thing here. We want to create a product that the field owner who, who spends a ton of money on has an opportunity to feel like they have something of value, which they do, and gives them the opportunity to use it again or recycle it or do, you know, have some other useful life after the first application of their life. So uh, I'm happy to work with you in the future um, in order to get this bill to a point where, where the STC could support it. Okay, any further questions for the opponents to the bill? Seeing none, thank you all. That concludes the public hearing on House Bill 857. We'll proceed to House Bill 991, Delegate Gilchrist. Jim? Yes, thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. May I bring up the Park and Planning Commission panel, please? You may electronically bring them to the fore. I have chairs for them. Oh, that's nice. Um, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, uh, I'm Delegate Jim Gilchrist, and this is House Bill 991 concerning forest mitigation banks and the Forest Conservation Act. Um, the Forest Conservation Act is used in the state to protect forests um, when developments begin. And uh, the um, forest mitigation banks have long played an important role in, in this process. When a developer begins a uh, development, uh, they submit to the local agency or, or to the state agency a, uh, a plan showing the for actual forest de delineation on site. Once that is approved, they then move on to explain how, how they're going to mitigate uh, the forest loss because of their project. Uh, only if on-site applications are exhausted um, the Forest Conservation Act allows developers to look off-site, and this is where forest mitigation banks um, come in, Mr. Chairman. Um, these off-site locations, they're prioritized. They're prioritized by environmental uh, soundness and effectiveness, and uh, Department of Natural Resources has a model uh, program, uh, and they work with the local governments um, to provide uh, guidance on minimum standards. This has been the process um, since the late 90s, but in October, an attorney general opinion said that forest mitigation banks um, don't have the backing in code um, that had been relied on. And so House Bill 991 is designed to get us back to where we were in September and literally for, for the decades before that. Um, that, is, that is the uh, point of the bill, that is the goal of the bill. Both Park and Planning Commission and Department of Natural Resources have been working on amendments which are very similar and uh, they're, they're continuing to work together on that. And Mr. Chairman, I would like to call up the Park and Planning Commission. I know Mr. Adrian Gardner is in the well, room. Well, I have, I have the following people who are signed up to, te uh, to testify in favor. Deborah Borden, um, uh, Amanda Farber, uh, Colby Ferguson, Matthew Wessel, 
Lori Graf, Adrian Gardner, would you like, um, and then a few others, uh, would you like Adrian to go first? Adrian and Deborah, please. Okay, we'll do it in that order. Uh, so we'll start off with Adrian Gardner and then Deborah Borden, and uh, we will then uh, proceed to all the others. But Adrian, welcome back to the committee. You've got two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, to the vice chair members, and of course our bill sponsor. Uh, my name is Adrian Gardner. Uh, it's my privilege to serve as the general counsel for the Power Complaining Commission. Um, you have our position statement, so I won't go over that. Our commission supports HB 91 with amendments that uh, Delegate Bill Chris was talking about that we've been working on with DNR, MAKO, and several other organizations. And I wanted to just say, I, I, there are not any showstoppers in reaching a consensus on those amendments. They really are up to wordsmithing. As Delegate Gilchrist mentioned, we're trying to restore one of the tools that was available for local governments to mitigate impact of trees. As most of you know, our state has a clear policy of reducing the number of trees and tree cover loss to development. Our agency is a part of that bad wagon. We absolutely are. In fact, we're on the right side of your last bill by Delegate Lehman as well. But under the current law, trees lost to construction can be mitigated through a variety of ways, planting new trees, enhancing lesser quality woodlands, on-site planting, off-site planting. The opinion last October eliminated one of the options that had existed for decades prior to that. That option was to use existing trees owned by third parties and those so-called banks. The bank owner was allowed to essentially encumber their property and then transfer the credit to an owner who needed to mitigate the clearing for a project. And if they used existing trees in one of those banks, one of the good things was he actually, whatever the obligation would have been for mitigation, 10 acres, 20 acres, whatever had to be mitigated, this method would require doubling it, two to one. That was a tool to preserve tr trees lost that we lost without the opinion. You may hear the argument that, it, that this methodology, this option doesn't actually add to the inventory of trees. Well, that may be true, but it certainly adds to the inventory of protected trees by a factor of two. You may also hear about needs to, dis to look at the whole Forest Conservation Act. We're on the bandwagon. We'd love to have that conversation, but right now we should clear up the problems with the existing pipeline of projects and the existing approvals. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd be happy to answer questions. Okay, uh, next, Deborah Borden. Thank you, Mr. Thank oh, you. there you are. Here. Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Um, I'm Deborah Borden. I am Deputy General Counsel for the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission. Um, I am actually the attorney who works closely with uh, both of our planning departments who handle the um, woodland and forest conservation uh, programs for Montgomery and Prince George's counties. I'm here to answer questions, um, uh, you know, particular questions about those programs, but I'm also here to, to let you know that, you know, the reason we, we brought this before you uh, this year in this, in this very difficult time is because um, the uh, AG's opinion just came out in October. And since October, uh, Montgomery County has run out of credits. So offsite credits um, are now limited only to planted areas and planted offsite credits are gone for Montgomery County. That is huge. Montgomery County has a lot of uh, development going on. It usually does. And this is going to put a number of the uh, pipeline projects, a number of, of the projects that have some of their approvals, but not all in limbo. It has already because we can't approve anymore. Uh, and so this is a major problem for us. Uh, and, and that is the only reason we are trying to get this, uh, get this dealt with uh, in, in such a, a difficult time period. So I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, happy to give you a primer on the on Forest Conservation Act, if you like. And uh, otherwise, I'll, I'll see you the rest of my time. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, there's no seating of time here, but thank you. Uh, let me go next to um, Amanda Farber. You're signed up in favor of the bill. Uh, yes, in favor with amendments. Okay, go ahead. Amanda. Um, so good afternoon, and I get you get to hear from me twice today. Uh, back lucky, to back. Lucky us for trees and turf, my two favorite subjects. So I don't I don't know what the odds are of, of this lineup, but um, anyway, my name is Amanda Farber. I'm a resident of Montgomery County, Maryland. I also submitted written testimony. 
I understand why Montgomery County and other counties are concerned about the language in the Forest Conservation Act and the recent Attorney General opinion. And I understand why this bill was introduced. However, I have two related concerns which I hope will be addressed. After a good deal of digging, I discovered the Purple Line, a number of down county development projects in Bethesda, and even a road project had something in common. They all used the same private forest bank in Barnesville, Maryland, consisting of existing trees, far from their sites, and nowhere near their watersheds for mitigation. I wondered how often this happened, but Montgomery County doesn't track the total number of acres mitigated for within or outside of the same watershed. So while preservation of existing forest is a worthy goal, I also urge the following. One, there should be an even greater emphasis and incentive for same or adjacent watershed mitigation, including forest bank mitigation, whether planting or existed, existing. And two, instead of having to comb through court, fil court filed land transaction records and MC Atlas GIS records, there should be a straightforward and publicly accessible accounting of which projects proposed to and ultimately do mitigate through offsite forest banks, either within or outside of their watershed. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Next, let's go to Colby Ferguson with the Farm Bureau. Colby? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, Colby Ferguson on behalf of Maryland Farm Bureau. Uh, we support uh, House Bill 991. Uh, it was brought to our attention back in, uh, back in uh, November, December, when we had a, uh, a Montgomery County Farm Bureau uh, legislative day and, and we, uh, morning, and we talked about different things. And this was brought up as a concern that it, it had just happened in October. And, and um, this was not just a Montgomery County issue. This was this is a whole state. And um, I live in Frederick County and work prior to coming to Farm Bureau for uh, Frederick County Office of Economic Development as the ag specialist. And we had a, quite a few farmers that uh, put their took a lot of their some of their poor quality ground, uh, maybe some areas that were along streams and and um, and creeks, and and put those into trees because it either flooded all the time or they had issues with just the poor quality soils. And uh, it made more sense to plant, put them in trees, and then put those areas into the forest banking program uh, for those to be existing. So, so they added two uh, already buffers that were there and uh, took those existing forests and paid the money, the cost to go through the process of putting, putting that in place. And it's not free. Uh, the, all those are permits. All those are, are easements that are put into there. And so they're sitting on these tracts of land uh, waiting for these fee and lieu of projects to come forward. And now with this October um, hearing or October opinion, they're basically out. Um, I've, I know farms that have been in these for eight to 10 years waiting on these projects to come forward and need the banking. And, and so now they've invested this money, they've invested this time and are looking for the benefit of utilizing that, that program. And because of this opinion uh, are not able to. And so this bill is just to address those problems. And we would want to at least make sure that those current uh, existing tracks that are in those programs are at least counted and, and allowed to be used. So with that, I'll stop and uh, ask for a favorable report. Okay, thank you, uh, Colby. Uh, next, uh, Matthew Wessel with uh, MBIA. Matthew? Yes, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Um, my name's Matt Wessel and I'm a Maryland landscape architect and ISA certified arborist with 20 years of experience implementing the uh, Maryland's Forest Conservation Act. For at least 20 years, mitigation banking has been an important component of the Forest Conservation Act that has conserved numerous acres of mature, high priority existing forest. In practice, mitigation banking incentivized the conservation of high priority existing forest, especially large tracts of contiguous forest in addition to planting new forest. The land is often conserved, planted, or banked years before it is ever utilized for mitigation credit provided, providing the environmental benefits up front. Mitigation banking is a market-based approach to conservation. Banks are priced at market rate and are influenced by supply and demand. To offset the costs associated with planting forests versus conserving forests, banked existing forests is credited as half as much as planted forest, as was uh, described earlier. Mitigation banking can be utilized once all other options contained in the Act's list of priority has been exhausted and is the last option before fee and, fee and lieu. 
as a result of the opinion in 2020, um, counties such as Montgomery and Prince George's have suspended the sale of credits from banks conserving and managing existing forest. Once the sales of credits were suspended, these banks in the tra tracks of uh, high mature high mature high priority forest they protect lost the financial incentive protecting them at last check only 13 acres of planted forest remains in montgomery county and i've heard that that's since been sold off and only 105 acres out of the approximately um, 1500 1594 acres of mitigation um, banking credit remains in prince george's county as I said, after mitigation banking, the only remaining option is in lieu fee, and in lieu fee is not preferred by the regulated community who would like to in an incentive, um, a market-based approach to incentivizing protection of forest. I don't, I, I hear from regulators that I interact with that they don't want to be in the business of planting forest, and I've heard testimony from the environmental community in the past who have expressed current concerns with in lieu fee. Um, I'll wrap it up by saying, um, without a return to the status quo, bankers who agreed to participate in the mitigation banking program um, will no longer be incentivized to do so and be forced to look at options that may longer. Okay, you'll, uh, if you could wrap up. Yeah, existing okay. force. Uh, th that's my testimony, Mr. Okay. Chairman. Thank you for allowing me to go over. Terrific. Um, thank you very much. Uh, Lori Graff. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Uh, Lori Graff, I'm CEO of the Maryland Building Industry Association. Um, I will not be repetitive because you've heard a lot about this issue already. Um, I just wanted to make a point, a couple of quick points. Um, we've been in this committee for the last several years talking about forest conservation. And one of the things we talk about a lot is the importance of existing forests. Um, so the concern to us is if you're disincentivizing um, the existing forest, um, it's going to um, remove a key in financial incentive um, to preserve these forests. It's a big concern of ours. I also wanted to point out, um, and Mr. Ferguson already made this issue, um, this is not just a Montgomery County issue, although we've talked a lot about Montgomery County and Prince George's County. This is a statewide issue. We've had lots of issues in different jurisdictions. I've heard from various members that are having um, major issues with this. Um, and the, the concern always is, just like every other bill you hear me talk about this, is housing affordability. Um, this could certainly make um, redevelopment more difficult much more expensive um, and can make um, housing just much more expensive um, as we move forward. So for those reasons, we'd like you to look at this bill and I'm happy to support a bill for once in this committee um, and uh, uh, urge a favorable report on uh, House Bill 991. Thank you. Thank you very much. And then uh, also favorable Angelica Bailey with MML. Uh, and then we'll go to the last two people who were favorable with amendments. So in, uh, Angelica. Yes, good afternoon, Chairman and members of the committee. My name is Angelica Bailey. I'm the Director of Government Affairs for the Maryland Municipal League. We are excited to support House Bill 991. Um, one of MML's strategic initiatives this year is climate change mitigation. Uh, lots of other folks have already spoken about this, but forest cre creation and conservation, it's obviously a very helpful tool Sometimes the FCA's requirements just aren't feasible for local governments, but this bill isn't like that. It allows the requirements to be met through maintenance. That's a very balanced approach. It enables our members to aid forest con and environmental health in a meaningful way. So we are very happy to support 991 and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Um, okay, so we will go now to the last two witnesses who are signed up favorable with amendments, James McKittrick and Alex uh, Alex Butler. Uh, James. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, Mr. Vice Chair, members of the committee. For the record, James McKittrick with the Maryland Department of Natural Resources. Uh, I guess I'm batting cleanup today, so I just wanted to package this up in, in you know, very digest digestible pieces, which is often very hard when we're talking about the Forest Conservation Act. Um, so I'll, I'll put, the, put a, the situation like this. Um, we had a very successful program um, in, in forest mitigation banks since the late 90s, um, incredibly successful. Um, I think, you know, many, many acres uh, preserved in participating counties. Uh, there was a opinion from the attorney general last fall that essentially eliminated the program. Uh, we are putting forward legislation and I'm very thankful uh, to Delegate Gilcrest and uh, Capital um, Parks and Planning Commission for putting this forward to in order to, to, to maintain the status quo, keep this program up and running. Uh, we ask that you know, we keep this bill status quo. Uh, if 
folks have issues or have other opinions about how this program should be uh, administered um, or put into law, I would please ask this committee to consider those in separate uh, legislative packages. Um, with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, well, we have one more person signed up favorable with amendments and that's Alex Butler with MAKO. Afternoon, Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee, Alex Butler with Maryland Association of Counties here supporting House Bill 991 with amendments. Uh, you have our written testimony and I'll be brief as the rest of the panel hit on, I think just about every major point. Uh, I just wanna say generally that we're, what we're hoping for here is to maintain existing longstanding practices in light of the Attorney General opinion. Uh, forest conservation banking is responsibly used by counties and developers to meet an applicant's offsite forest plan requirements uh, and conserving already existing forest land can be a central component in many existing banks. Um, banks generally offer good coverage in the event that on-site planning replanting is not feasible. Uh, and as other panelists have already said, what we want is a return to the status quo uh, and nothing further. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Okay, um, questions for the sponsor or and the um, witnesses. It looks like Delegate Love has the first hand up. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and first up, I want to thank uh, Adrian and Deborah um, for reaching out to me and talking to me about it. And um, to be upfront, I, I've learned more since we talked and, and now sure. I have a number of concerns that I didn't raise to you when we talked. So I just I want to be upfront about that. Um, one of the concerns that I have is I feel like we are rushing through a major policy shift under the guise of we're just making sure that we're keeping the status quo. So the forest, the, what the Attorney General's opinion did was look at the Forest Conservation Act and what it says. And to do this, this um, I'm gonna cut down trees here and just promise not to cut down trees here, doesn't seem to be what the Forest Conservation Act was all about and isn't what the language says that it is. So one of my concerns right now is that we as a committee and as a state take a look at our policy and say, what is it that we really want with our Forest Conservation Act? Are we looking to plant more trees? Or is it okay to cut down a whole bunch of trees and just say, well, um, if we cut down all those trees, I just promise we're not gonna cut down those later. And what's the protection of making sure we don't cut down those later? So my question is, um, given that we passed Delegate Healy's bill a couple of years ago to provide a technical study, don't you think it makes more sense to wait for that technical study and to find out the status of our forest first to make sure that we aren't losing forests as we are using this um, tool that has been used that isn't actually authorized under the Forest Conservation Act. Um, Delegate Love, I'll take a stab at that if you'd like and thank you for the question. I would say a couple things. One is, and this may be something that Mr. McKittrick might want to talk about as well, because I'm not sure exactly how the interpretation evolved to the point that um, existing forest was appropriate for uh, forest conservation banking, but um, it has been. It has been for 20 years. Um, it's currently enshrined in regulations. In fact, it's enshrined in the model ordinance. Everybody thought that this was the law. And so when, you, when, when we think about major policy shifts, I would say sort of two things. No, I don't think it would necessarily be better for a couple of reasons. One is the people who made investments expecting to help mitigate projects. And two is the people who are trying to mitigate projects and expected to sort of be able to rely on that. And the only other thing I would point out is that of all of the conservation requirements, there are other, there are other mitigation um, options that give you multiple um, you know, multiples of conservation or preservation, but this works on top of those. So the, the, by, for the first time, we're talking about actually bolting that part into the law. And one of the amendments that I think we've got consensus on will include the requirement that it's always two for one. So whatever the mitigation obligation is under standard practice, 
this will enshrine and codify the point that it will always be double if you use existing force. So I think there's so much, and as I said, we're on the bandwagon. Our agency is on the bandwagon uh, about making sure that trees are not cut. The first actual major uh, uh, program actually in the state program is modeled to, to a large extent out of what happened in Prince George's County first. We're on that bandwagon, but we don't think it would be better to wait to answer your question. And I hope that's helpful. Yeah, if, if I may further characterize this, and, and uh, thank you very much for Mr. Gardner um, in, in his response. Uh, so, so Delegate, you know, I know you asked a question about how this arose. Uh, I think we have Phil Hager, who's our Assistant Secretary, who's, I'm sorry for my chair, uh, who's, who's on the call. Um, I think he, Trish, I, I don't know if he's, he's made it in, he might be able to answer that. Um, and we can always follow up afterwards. But, uh, you know, I think the approach, the approach where you would be advocating for is, um, you know, we have folks who are currently being hurt by the uh, attorney general's opinion. We have folks who have done the right thing. They've gone through the right processes, uh, processes, um, and all of a sudden the, the, the ground is pulled out from underneath them. Um, to not act, to, to make those folks whole or to uh, not leave them hanging, um, I, I, you know, I think is not good policy. Uh, even if it is for, you know, based on a, a broader study um, that it sounds like, um, you know, you'd, you'd like to see. So uh, that would be my point. Okay. Uh, next question goes to... Next question. Trying to find out who was uh, next, and that appears to be Delegate Jay Jacobs, Delegate Brooke Learman, and Jen Terraza in that order. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I guess Mr. Gardner's question would be for you, or it could be for either one, but um, I'm, I'm just trying to get some clarification. I'm, you know, I've heard a lot here today. I printed out the attachment A of the AG's opinion, and I haven't had time to read it because it's a whole tree right there. I killed a, killed a tree printing that out this morning. <laughs> so, so in, <laughs> in layman's terms, could you could you just and quickly in layman's terms, kind of you know tell me what that what that says, so I can put that in perspective with what the bill does. I'm. I think I understand, but I, if you could quickly kind of put this in layman's terms, I'm, I'm not a lawyer. Can I take that one, Adrian? Okay. Sure, absolutely. Oh, me. I think I can, I can do it really quickly. So the, um, uh, the Forest Conservation Act requires that when you are cutting down more than, or, or clearing more than uh, 5,000 square feet to do a project, you have to then comply with our mitigation. And the mitigation is set up like a, a system of priority. So the first priority is that you save as many trees on your site as you can and still build your project. Second, we, we want you to plant as many trees on your, on your property and still build your project, right? So first is save, second is plant. Those are absolutes. We must see that you have maxed out your ability to do those two things on your property before we will let you even consider going offsite. Okay, so once you've done that, then we look at what's left, what you still have to mitigate, and then you can go offsite to a, to a mitigation bank and you can pick from the, uh, uh, the planted areas that are in the bank and the existing forest that's in the bank. Again, first we want you to do planting, then we, we allow you to, to uh, buy credits for the existing forest in the bank. And then and only then, once you've maxed out that, can you then make a case for a fee in lieu for whatever mitigation requirement you still have left? So that's the way it works. It's, it's an order of priority and we take everybody through that order of priority on every single project. So this, particular piece that we're talking about is just the offsite banking credits for existing forest. For that particular piece, 
the AG says, look, there's offsite, there's, there's language in the state code for offsite afforestation, but there's no language in there that specifically talks about offsite for preservation, for preserved forest that's already there, but it's been put into preservation in order to sell credits. They said that's not in there, even though it's in the regulations, even though it's in our past practice, we've been doing it for years, but it's not technically in the state code. So that's what we're talking about with uh, with House Bill 991. Thank you very much. Okay, try not to kill any trees between now and dinner time. Um, uh, Delegate Learman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I have a couple of questions for a couple of different people. Um, so I'm just gonna say them and then maybe you can answer. So the first one is um, for Alex Butler at MAKO. Um, uh, I know it's. I know you submitted favorable testimony, and I see that Baltimore County Executive submitted written favorable testimony. Uh, and I don't mean this negatively at all. This feels like very driven by Montgomery County uh, uh, right now. And so I'm just curious. Like, is it just that there are not other counties who are out of forest, and that's why Montgomery County is sort of here, or is or what do other counties not have this issue? Is it really just among? Is it just in the you know? Uh, Maryland National Capital Planning area that this is an issue. So that's my first question. Um, and my second question is, um, and poor James knows that I care a lot about transparency. Um, I, I'm curious, I, I thought that the, um, uh, the gentlewoman um, who spoke, her point about not being able to find information about what is being mitigated for what project connects to what piece of mitigation is a really interesting one. And I'm wondering, um, is there any centralized repository? I mean, it sounds like not of that somebody like I could just go look up and say, oh, there's a development happening. I'd like to know what their mitigation plan is and look at it um, at the state level, or does that exist at the county level? And if it exists at the county level, what are the requirements and how does Montgomery County or other counties, uh, I don't think any other counties are on here to speak, but I'm curious how, Montgomery County handles that and um, what transparency, like what transparency measures are in place and where on their website we can find that. Thank you. Delegate, I'll take a, a shot at the first question there. Um, no, it is not just the capital region, although I'm, I'm sure that they are uh, likely the hardest hit by the attorney general opinion. Uh, there is support from uh, several of the jurisdictions uh, throughout the state uh, in different areas. Um, a couple of counties do not utilize mitigation banking um, and this does not require them to do so. Um, okay. So I, I hope that answered. That's helpful. Thank yeah. you. So some people don't even use it. They just do, they they either, they do either, but, or what do they do if they don't use it? I mean, so if they have a development and they have some requirement, they have this requirement in state law, what do they do if they don't use mitigation banking? So they follow the existing practices that, um, you know, Ms. Borden, uh, you know, laid out, you know, taking the, the other steps. Area, the other, okay, okay. Yeah, other, other, there, are, there are a variety of different tactics. Right. Um, and in some areas, it just makes a lot more sense uh, to do mitigation banking. And that's that's not something that is limited to the national capital region. Okay, thanks. And then on that transparency question, how can somebody like me or anybody who's not an elected office to find out how, what what the mitigation plan is for a development? Uh, well, I, I can have yeah. at that. Sure. Um, so at least in Montgomery and Prince George's counties, you can um, take a look at the, if you have a particular project involved in, in mind, you can go online and take a look at the, um, in Montgomery, we call them uh, uh, forest conservation plans. In Prince George's, they're called tree conservation plans. You can actually look at that plan. You can look at the approval. You can see um, what they have uh, uh it's, it's basically a worksheet and, and they indicate what they're going to do and how much mitigation they um, are supposed to uh, uh, cobble together because it's, it's usually more than one option that they're using. They're using a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and a little bit of the other. Uh, and so you can go online and take a look at that. We also have online a list of all of the mitigation banking um, that's available in the county and we update that list on a monthly basis. And you can see you know, who the bankers are and how much they have in existing forest versus planted forest. 
um, and you can see sort of a running list of how much they have left at any given time. And you can also see where it's located. Uh, and so all of that is available on our websites. Um, you know, whether that information, well, there are, there are annual reports that we then send to DNR. And um, I'm not sure that DNR does a, a sort of an, an amalgamated report for all of the, the counties, but we do send that information on an annual basis to DNR. And I, and I believe that information is available on their website as well. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, next question goes to Delegate Terraza, then the vice chair. Okay, thank you, um, Mr. Chairman. Okay, so that led me to a couple of follow-up questions. So this is decided by each jurisdiction. Each, jurisdic each jurisdiction is allowed to decide whether or not to do this and they approve the forest conservation plan. Is that, is that what I was understanding Ms. Gordon or whoever was? Yeah, not exactly because each program that at the local level has to go through a biannual review from DNR to make sure that DNR is, um, has, has, has determined that the program is compliant. So there's a built-in mechanism so that any changes, all the numbers are, are reported out. So while each jurisdiction has the option to choose from the menu of different ways to, uh, to, you know, to develop a, um, a program, uh, the program has to be approved by DNR. I think that's okay. answer. Okay, but then they, they approve it per project. No, they just no, um, Delegate Terrasa. They they approve the, the 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 components and the rules and the regulations and the manual that guide each local program. And so, the lo DNA, but okay. not uh, not a not a project by project approval. The local program. Correct. Does the project by project approval? Precisely. It's almost like the, the authority of the state has been delegated. And if you don't have a compliant program, then DNR will actually. Um, it's a, it's a delegation that's subject to that approval process. Okay, and then, so this is kind of like Delegate Learman's question, but maybe the inverse. Um, not how can you figure out whether, how each project mitigated their tree loss, um, but how do you track, um, well, I guess in some ways, how are these preserved? Are there easements? Are there, and those are tracked by the counties in the I'll, land records? I'll pitch that to Deborah, but yes, uh, they are tracked um, and recorded um, and maintained and, and sketched out. In the land records or in the forest con plans? In both. Um, so when uh, a landowner decides they want to participate in this program, there's a process they have to go through. Um, you know, it's not just any, any tree, any, any uh, piece of land, you know, it has to fit certain uh, criteria. Uh, it has to meet the definition of forest, which means it has to be a certain size in minimum, a minimum size. And um, they have to agree in, in, at least in Montgomery and Prince George's County, they have to agree to a certain uh, management plan. They can't just plant the trees and go away. They have to take care of them. The trees then have to progress and grow to a certain caliper um, in order to, you know, be able to um, qualify for the for participation in this in this uh, program. And so, you know, assuming they they get through all of those hoops, then the the again the property owner who who wants to establish this bank um, has to record an easement on the property to preserve those trees. Um, and then uh, once they get that certified by the county uh, or, you know, by the uh, planning de department, then they can start selling credits. And when they sell a credit, the credit then gets reviewed by our planners and a transfer certificate will be uh, issued. And okay. then that gets uh, recorded with land records. So okay. everything is in land records. Everything is reviewed. Okay. Everything it's just what what's not um, within our control is the actual market rate and the and the market. Okay, no, price. I, I got that. But I guess my okay. my question is then: What happens if they or a subsequent owner doesn't maintain the tree, cuts down the tree? How does that? How does that? How does that work? 
well, that would be, um, uh, you know, a violation of that program. And we would handle that within, you know, within the program requirements. In other words, we would either find the person, kick them out of the program. Um, there are n a number of things that we could do. I have to admit, though, that hasn't happened. I mean, we don't really have that happen happen yet because this, this is a business. You know, these, these, okay. these owners are trying to, you know, they're trying to stay in the business so that they can keep, keep selling credits because that's how they get their, the value of their investment out of, you know, out of the, you know, out of the land. But eventually they'd be, they could run out of trees. Sure. Eventually they run okay. out of area and then usually they find a new area, you know, either to plant trees or to preserve. Okay. And then if the issue, this is going back to the, the statement that I think a few of you made about, I think um, Mr. McKittrick and Mr. Butler maybe, about their people were, well, I, or maybe Mr. Gardner, I'm, I apologize if I had that wrong, but there were people who were caught in the middle and maybe didn't necessarily sound like it was the issue of this was the right policy, but a concern about people caught in the middle. And I guess my question would be, why change the policy if this isn't necessarily necessarily a better policy rather than come up with a way to help the people who were sort of caught in the middle of relying on it well, rather I guess, than change it going forward. I guess I would say that being sort of close to the ground on this, um, that A, it is a good policy because it works, because there are options you're right. not pushing everybody, you know, every single piece of property is different. Every single right. project is different. And so the more options we have for complying with our environmental uh, regulations, the better right. it is for the state. Right? right. I understand that you think it's better, but I think there were several others that weren't as clear on whether this was a better policy, but right. that they were concerned about the people caught in the middle. And maybe they right. can answer that question. And that's, that's it for my I think okay. unless I have a follow up to that, but I think that's it for my question. Delegate Traza, I'd say that that you hit the nail on the head where Farm Bureau comes in. We have a lot of uh, farm farmland owners, uh, farmers that have gone through the time of, of putting putting these uh, uh, forested areas in, um, either replanting a few of them and adding to acreage to make sure they meet the minimum number of, of acres uh, that need to be banked and have gone through the process and are basically sitting and waiting. And now because of a AG's opinion in October have lost all the value because uh, they're basically kicked out. So yeah, you, you hit the nail on the head. I, I don't necessarily know if, the, if it's a bad policy to just do straight uh, forced planting over forced conservation, but you know, to change the, change the rules of the game in the middle of the game uh, is, is definitely a negative. Yeah, if I can jump in on this. Um... You know, I, that's that's our main point. Um, and I actually lucky enough, uh, Phil Hager, our assistant secretary for land resources, uh, has has joined us and is able to expound a little bit more. So, Phil, if you want to jump in. You know, um, Phil, do you want to jump in there? Look, um, we've got a couple of um, more questions here. And I think, I, I mean, I think the shape of the uh, discussion is pretty well fleshed out. Uh, before I recognize the vice chair, let me just ask Adrian. Um, so if I go and buy some wooded property, would I be able to sell um, part of that property into the program for credits? Is, is that how the system works? Well, you wouldn't need to sell the property. You would have to make an ironclad agreement to maintain the no, property. I wasn't say, no, no, no. I wasn't saying I was selling. I okay. bought, if I bought a wooded parcel of land, say 10 acres, could I then uh, buy property? I'd be happy to do that. Uh, good afternoon. Phil Hager, Assistant Secretary for Land Resources at DNR. I'd like to just to reinforce a couple of points that and well, hold on, hold on, Phil, Phil, made. I was Phil, uh, I, I was in the middle was... of Phil, I was in the middle of asking a question. Um, Adrian, um, I'm trying. Can I, if I bought a, a ten uh, 
acre parcel. So land land can I sell? Can yes. I sell? Yes, I believe you could sell. You could use your property to use as credits for um, other people's projects if you went through the process of getting it approved um, for that purpose. Okay. The vice chair has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And just to follow up on the chairman's question, Del Gatras's question, you know, I, I recognize that um, that there are some um, some individuals, farmers, forest owners who were caught flat-footed by the AG's opinion and may very well have um, invested money that they'll be out now because of this policy. What if there was a way, and I don't know how we'd come up with a standard, but what if there was a way to protect those individuals so that their, their investment, their forest banks could still be used going forward while at the same time we wait for the FCA study um, that was commissioned by Delegate Healy's bill to come out, because part of that study is to evaluate the effectiveness of these forest mitigation banks. That would help us, because that would grandfather in the existing forested uh, projects that are, that are in the pipeline to be used whenever. But yeah, I think a grandfather clause would be wonderful and then at least keeps the the guys that are already in there um, still eligible. Mr. Vice Chairman, could I just offer two, two cents on that point and that question? It's a, it's a great question, but I would sure. say- um, Yes, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the, the, the challenge that we have in Montgomery and Prince George's, and I don't think it's just unique to the Metro Washington area, but it really has to do with the fact that our land use policies already have really, really incredibly strong policies in place that discourage redevelopment of farms, discourage redevelopment of areas that are already forested. And when you do that, and then you then couple that with a real estate market that is that requires infill development, and it requires um, a lot of mitigation for our school construction programs and for, you know, for, for all of those kinds of things. And you take that tool off the table. One of the things we haven't had a chance to mention is the fact that it's going to, that it's going to number one, prove difficult, but number two, it's, it's probably going to change the economics of certain projects, including public projects for our school systems and for other public project owners in a way that's going to create, um, you know, sincere problems. I, I, I so I guess that, um, of course, there's, I, you know, there's, there's certainly a way to do that. I think it would be very, very difficult in our jurisdictions to make that, um, to, to, to not have this as part of the toolbox, if you will, um, going forward, at least until the report comes out. I mean, because I do think, as I said, we are on the bandwagon uh, about trees, uh, but we do think that it would be better to, to, to have this in place at least until the until the, the 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 real analysis is done. Okay, thank you. You know, I, I, I somebody to uh, comment on this. I, I find a curious analogy between this and uh, zero um, uh, uh, um, zero emission vehicle credits, where companies that build electric cars are able to sell credits to other companies so that they can offset their pollution in the European Union or in California. I mean, isn't that basically the same kind of concept here? Some people own uh, forest land and they are making money from that forest land by selling credits? Yes. yes in some places they call it cap and trade. And um, I mean, it's the, it is the same economic concept that uses a marketplace um, to help achieve a public policy objective. And I guess what one of the points that we'd make is that it, you know, it hasn't really been broken. And this is the only mechanism that takes all of the mitigation requirements and doubles it. And as I said before, the, the, the people who are concerned about this bill are fair to point out that it doesn't actually add to the tree inventory. But you have to also realize that it certainly does add to the protected tree inventory. So for that reason, I would think that you should um, uh, give serious consideration to that. Any further questions for uh, the sponsor or the proponents before I go to the opponent of the bill? Oh, Delegate Boyce. 
Thank you so much. I, I, I've been I've been trying to take it all in, and so I just want to clarify what I understand, and especially to uh, Mr. Gardner's point, and and to I think um, Deborah Borden's point. So this provision is in addition to the other two factors of um, saving as many trees as you can, planting as many trees as you can. And then it's like, if you can either do one or the other or both or neither, then you have a third option. So it is in extension of, not in lieu of, is that? Okay, so that, that's my question. And then to Mr. Um, uh, Gardner's last point, you, you, you mentioned that, um, and I guess I can see that it, it adds to the, per, it preserves more, I guess, force area. I guess the question that I have is if it's in a bank and you're, pres and if you don't have option one or two and you use this bank as a way to say, I'm going to preserve this set of land then does that come off the books as in that it can't be used again? So somebody can't use that again because once it's protected, it's protected. And precisely, precisely, Delegate Boyce. That's okay. It's recorded in land records. It cannot okay. be I thought I heard you said that early. I just want to make sure I understand. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, let's go to the opponents. Uh, and I believe uh, there are several people who are uh, who have written testimony against the bill, but only one person has signed up to uh, testify, and that is Eric Fisher on behalf of the Chesapeake Bay Foundation. Eric, you out there? Chairman Barve, members of the committee. Um, Eric Fisher, Maryland Assistant Director for the Chesapeake Bay Foundation. I'm also a certified urban planner. Um, we are unfortunately finding ourselves opposed to uh, this bill. Uh, we need to be clear about what the status quo is in Maryland with regards to forest loss. We are losing 3,000 acres a year of forest and the vast majority of that is coming at the hands of development. This is coming within a state that has a no net loss of forest policy. That means that when trees come down, trees need to be replaced. Forest Conservation Act drives some tree replacement. It needs to be stronger, but it gets us at least the bare minimum. This proposal, would mean you could clear an entire site and not replant a single tree. That is not an offset. An offset is I take trees down, you put them back, and I pay you to put them back. This is a I take trees down and we preserve other trees somewhere else that may or may not be at risk of development itself. The law and the regulations have both been very clear that forest banks may not take credit for existing trees. The regulations cited by the proponents does not contemplate forest banking. There's a separate section in the regulation dealing with forest banks that allow for afforestation and reforestation. We support those pieces, but not this extension. Our biggest issue is about the rug being pulled out from under us, as Mr. McKittrick said. We are standing squarely on that rug on the shoulders of this committee and the General Assembly, who two years ago asked the very questions that need to be answered before this proposal or others like it can move forward. We ask you in good faith and simply in terms of process to have, have that study completed before we move forward with this legislation. Thank you very much for your time. Um, Eric, I have a very quick question. You said we're losing 3,000 acres of uh, forest land. What, what percentage of the total forest land of the state is that, do you know? Uh, we have uh, about 2 million acres of forest statewide. Um, so you, if you look over time, it's a significant amount and it varies by jurisdiction. Some of these more quickly developing jurisdictions, Charles County uh, lost about 7% of their forest cover in just 12 years. So they're losing almost a percent per year. So okay, so year, all I have to do is take the 3,000 divide by 2 million? On an annual basis, yes. I mean, okay, all right. Years well, do go not, by, Chairman. Okay, well, that was asked and answered. Thank you. Uh, any other questions for the Chesapeake Bay Foundation, uh, Delegate Boyce? I just, um, thank you, um, Mr. Chairman. So, um, I, I heard, I heard what you said, and so um, 
And I think it's a, it's a fair statement. I, I just wanna put something into context. So let's say of all the development projects that end up coming up, let's say for some strange reason, a miracle that there isn't any land to take from because everything else has been essentially where one could take from would have been banked and preserved. And I think, um, what are your thoughts about that? Because I'm, I'm hearing two different things. I'm hearing that in most cases that their land and uh, forest will be protected. And if that's them protected, then it sounds like if that's happening more than clearing, then it sounds like at some point there won't be anything to even take from. So it's it sounds like, so I'm just trying to get uh, a uh, so clarification from you, and then again, I guess clarification from the the group in just a scenario of like again, how many? What is the percentage of land being preserved versus land being cleared? Yes. So you mentioned the three thousand trees a year, but when we're talking about development, right? Um, there is a certain percentage of land that is preserved. We have preservation goals in the state and we have a number of programs that are dedicated to acquiring land for preservation, including program open space, uh, mouth, rural legacy, all of those programs, their goal is to preserve land and they're doing a good job of it. Forest Conservation Act's goal is to minimize loss of forest from development. And so replanting is an essential part of that that we don't have in other preservation programs. So we're trying to maintain balance here in regards to replanting. Um, Montgomery I, County I, has 700 acres of unbuffered streams alone. So there's still room to put trees. Oh, okay, so I guess that's not my question. I'm trying to think about it in like a, the most static state, right? So if of the 2 million acres you said we have in the state, does anybody know how much of that is actually preserved, untouchable? I could get those numbers for you. That would be helpful. I mean, that would be helpful to just kind of sort this all out. Because I, I guess the way I would see it, if we're in a position where someone in development is actually preserving space versus, let's say, and this is just a scenario because I don't know what the percentages are, versus clearing space, it would seem like we would be not adding, while they're not adding, we're also still not taking away. So, I mean, unfortunately, it's a clean, it's a clean break in that, but, but that wouldn't be the case for every development project. So I, I guess I'm just trying to figure out kind of the percentages of folks who would end up having the last resort of having to use a bank whether it's clearing or preserving versus then development that's actually planting. And yes, that, that's an important question and one that the legislature specifically directed be answered by this technical study. Okay. So we would like that yeah. technical study to be completed before we make these decisions as a group. Okay, any further questions? Seeing none, thank you very much. Um, that ends the public hearing for House Bill 991. We'll now proceed to House Bill 992, Delegate Gilchrist. No one signed up except you, so not likely that you'll consume another hour and a half of our time. Oh, I could do it. <laughs> I could do it, Mr. Chairman. Um, House Bill 992 um, concerns the uh, board of the Maryland Environmental Trust. Um, I'm Delegate Jim Gilchrist. This is House Bill 992. Um, Maryland, Maryland Environmental Trust uh, works with landowners, local communities, and land trusts across Maryland uh, to protect our most treasured landscapes and nat natural resources. It's one of the oldest and most successful uh, land trusts in the country. It protects over 130,000 acres. Um, in 2016, the legislature uh, made major changes about how the board is selected. Um, before that, it was a self-appointing board, a self-perpetuating uh, board. Uh, in 2016, it was changed 
that the governor um, sends over three names, the president three and the speaker three. Um, what we're finding is that this um, system is, is running into difficulty. Um, it's tough to get volunteers on the board who are told, you know, if you volunteer, you have a two out of three chance of being turned down. And so in practice, it, it hasn't been working. And essentially it's turned into, you know, the governor sending over two, the president one and the speaker one. So what this bill will do is change the process for selecting the board um, to um, solve that problem. Mr. Chairman, there's also an, an amendment I've asked to be drafted, uh, which would uh, repeal and code that uh, 10 members of the board are required for a quorum. Um, because we're having um, trouble with the full complement of the board, um, we're, we would like to uh, remove that and then it can be handled in, in bylaws um, based on the number of board members that we actually have. Um, that is House Bill 992, Mr. Chairman. Okay, uh, any questions for the sponsor of the bill? All righty then, that concludes the public hearing on House Bill 992. Let's go to House Bill 1025, Delegate Terraza. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I believe this will be longer than 992, but probably shorter than 991, I hope. <laughs> um, Good afternoon, Chairman Barve and Vice Chairman Stein and esteemed members of the Environment and Transportation Committee. Thank you for this opportunity to present House Bill 1025, which would eliminate stockpiles of carbofurin, a dangerous pesticide banned over a decade ago that continues to contribute to the death of wildlife, including bald eagles, and also poses significant risk to human health. For the record, I'm Delegate Jen Tarasa. Um, the EPA banned the use of all forms of the pesticide carbofurin in December 2009. According to the EPA at that time, dietary, worker, and ecological risks are unacceptable for all uses of carbofurin. All products containing carbofurin generally cause unreasonable adverse effect on humans and the environment and do not meet safety standards, therefore are ineligible for re-registration. The EPA determined that the carbofurin, that carbofurin is highly mobile in soils, dissolves in water, and has been commonly found in groundwater. And in fact, a single grain of carbofurin can kill a songbird. However, the ban did not include a requirement that the remaining stockpiles be confiscated or otherwise disposed of. So the existing stockpiles remain and continue to be used illegally, posing a danger to human and wild, human health and wildlife especially concerning is the threat to bald eagles. According to DNR, the, the illegal use of carbofurin in Maryland has resulted in the death of 19 eagles since it was banned. Some estimates are much, much higher. While I'm not suggesting that anyone's trying to harm eagles, they are the unintended victims of carbofurin's continued use. Here's how it works. Old stock of carbofurin is sometimes used to kill foxes, coyotes, raccoons, or other farm pests. And unfortunately, eagles are scavengers, so they feed on the animals while they're in distress or, or on their remains. And even small amounts of carbofurin are lethal enough to kill them. These eagle deaths and poisonings have been investigated by, D by Maryland Natural Resource Police and the US Fish and Wildlife Services. However, since it's not illegal, to possess carbofurin, the investigations have been hindered. What um, this bill does is address the loophole in the law that has made illegal, the illegal and deadly use of carbofurin possible. Um, to be clear, it would not ban carbofurin that was done in 2009, but would prohibit a person from possessing or storing any quantity of carbofurin after January 1, 2024. It authorizes the Maryland Department of Agriculture and the Maryland Department of Natural Resources to eliminate stockpiles of carbofurin in the state to ensure all quantities of carbofurin that are collected and seized are destroyed by 2023 and allows DNR or the Department of Agriculture to seize any quantities of carbofurin to enforce this section. I've heard concerns from the grain producers and the Farm Bureau, I think they wrote in about their concerns with the bill that this bill involves the Department of Natural Resources, not just Maryland Department of Agriculture, and a clarification in the bill stating that um, the Natural Resource Police could only seize carbofurin as part of a wildlife investigation would probably um, 
probably quell some of those concerns. Um, and with that, I respectfully urge a favorable report. Okay. Um, we have the following people signed up in favor of the bill. Mark Sutherland, uh, Robin Clark, Carolyn Parsa, Frank Kunir. They're, they're the su supporters. So let's start with Mark Sutherland. Mark, welcome to the committee. Uh, you have two minutes. Okay, thank you, Chair Barve, Vice Chair Stein, and members of the committee. Um, my name is Mark Sutherland. I am a member of Safe Skies Maryland, which is a statewide organization focused on the conservation of birds, wildlife, and their connection to the human community. Uh, Delegate Trassa has done a great job covering this bill. It's really very straightforward, so I will be brief. Um, really, it's a gap in the law. Um, it's a loophole that we need fixed. Um, carbofuran is very bad stuff, as she indicated. It's toxic to people, pets, uh, farm animals, wildlife, and the environment. And even though it was banned by EPA in 2009, it still exists in sheds, buildings around the state, um, providing a real hazard. Um, individuals um, can be contaminated with this because it's in thin paper bags um, unknowingly. So that's quite a danger. So it's basically, you know, sort of a disaster uh, waiting to happen. And actually, it's not really waiting to happen. It's actually happening. And as Delegate Tarasin mentioned, um, it's actually been used to um, kill uh, predators like fox that are thought to threaten uh, ducks and other um, animals for hunting. And in doing so, not only kills those predators, which is illegal, but also kills scavengers, which include many other kinds of wildlife, uh, hawks, and many bald eagles, um, probably more than 30 or maybe much more than that, just in the state of Maryland. So what we need to do is remove the stockpiles. Um, again, it was just a gap in the law. We need to fix that. Um, well, we can, we can do that with this bill. It's basically going to allow the Department of Agriculture and Department of Natural Resources to collect these um, pesticides, to take them away so that no one will be in danger anymore. Um, otherwise, these continued hazards and deaths will continue. So I won't give you any more. I have some more details in my uh, testimony, but Frank Kunsier, who is the expert, will speak later in the panel. Okay, Robin Clark with um, the Chesapeake Bay Foundation. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Um, thank you for the time. Robin Clark with the Chesapeake Bay Foundation here today in support of House Bill 1025. I uh, just wanted to, to raise in addition to the points raised by others that this pesticide is also damaging to marine life. Uh, the way our scientists described it to me, a layperson, um, crustaceans are essentially bugs of the sea. So <laughs> it will affect them too. And it will also affect the larvae that can form the base of that food web uh, in the bay. So for those reasons, we do hope you'll take action with this uh, cleanup provision and help us clean up the bay. CBF supports the, the legislation and thanks you for your time. Before I recognize uh, Carolyn Parsa, you, you remind me of a a joke I played on Chris Van Hollen when he was a member of the House of Delegates, I bet him that if he was right and I was wrong, that I would eat a bug. And it turned out he was right. So I ended up going down to Buddy's Crabs and pointed out to him, basically it was a large sea roach. Perfect. <laughs> so, uh, Carolyn Parsa. Hello. Good afternoon, Chair Barve. Vice Chair Stein and committee members. My name is Carolyn Parsa, and I'm testifying on behalf of the over 75,000 members and supporters of the Maryland Sierra Club. Sierra Club supports HB 1025. Thank you, Delegate Tarasa, for sponsoring this bill. I'm not going to repeat what others have said here, um, but I do want to say that um, one point about eagles that the Eagles made a remarkable recovery after DDT was banned, uh, but now our national bird faces another threat. Over 30 Eagles have died in Maryland since 2016 from carbofuran poisoning. And even though wild Eagles are no longer on the endangered species list, they're still protected by two federal laws, the Bald and Golden Eagle Protection Act and the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. When Officials investigate an eagle poisoning. 
even if they determine the cause of death to be carbofurin poisoning, they cannot confiscate any carbofurin they find. Eagle investigations into eagle poisonings are expensive, time consuming, and often unsuccessful in protecting the birds because they cannot remove the carbofurin stockpiles. Only with legal backing can law enforcement uh, officials confiscate the chemical and send it for proper disposal. So we respectfully request a favorable report. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Next, Frank Kinnear. Did I pronounce your name correctly, sir? Mr. Kinnear? You're going to have to unmute yourself. Uh, we can't hear you. You have to mute, unmute yourself. Can someone uh, text Mr. If, if somebody has Mr. Kinnear's number, could somebody text him to unmute himself? Maybe he can't hear me. Yeah, Frank, just move your cursor down to the bottom of the screen and you'll see the unmute button. It looks like a little microphone. There we go. There we go. Sorry, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> I was attempting all the while. <clears throat> now, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, committee members, and Delegate Terraza for your sponsorship. My name is Frank Kinsier. I'm a retired special agent with the United States Fish and Wildlife Service, having served in that capacity almost 30 years. I was <clears throat> stationed in Maryland for 25 years until I transferred out of state, uh, took on other responsibilities. During my uh, tenure in both Annapolis and Cambridge, uh, starting about 1985, in the Chesapeake Bay, we had received reports of hundreds of migratory bird deaths that were found to be caused by carbofuran or furidan by trade name. I conducted 25 of these alone uh, during my tenure. This carbamate uh, family restricted use pesticide uh, was <laughs> used in its granular, planting, planted with corn and soybeans. Uh, it's a systemic matticide. It was planted as a side dressing or in the furrow with the kernel of corn. Birders then would walk down the furrow ingesting or <clears throat> dermally feeding it, uh, getting it in their digestive tracts and their feet and bill. It affects the central nervous system. Birds die, and most often die immediately in a deathful death, <clears throat> death row. Uh, and others seek cover, a natural mechanism. They'll go into brush burrows. Uh, and, uh, and trees. It's as uh, as I mentioned, it's extremely toxic to birds. Uh, here in Maryland, research with Fish and Wildlife Service uh, <clears throat> in one study found that uh, they placed it in, in, an, in the area of the field of Western Maryland. Only 25% of the known victims were retrieved. All the rest disappeared <clears throat> having been scavenged, scavenged within 24 hours. Uh, during the 1980s and 1990s, uh, law enforcement division, division investigated many bald and golden eagle <coughs> poisoning deaths. Many were found, many found by uh, laced <coughs> sardine cans or chicken carcass baits. Dead predators were found adjacent to the epicenter. Eagles with as much as 11% pure <coughs> were found. <coughs> Victims surrounding outward to as many as 12 miles away, giving it what we call. If you could wrap up your testimony, sir, the committee has lots of questions, and I think they certainly. Uh, I did aerial searches in 1988 and found that uh, when I would see dead carcasses out in the fields, oftentimes by the time I came back to retrieve them, they were already gone. It's called feather spots. Uh, okay. All right. Well, listen, I, I think we've got several people who want to ask you and others questions, so why don't we proceed to that? And um, I will. First call on the first person who I think, whoops, here we go, hold on. Okay, the first question goes to Delegate Otto, then Delegate Lehman, then Delegate Boyce, in that order. Delegate Otto. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, maybe the sponsor could tell me, what, when's the last case that carbofuran has been uh, implicated in a death of an eagle or other animals? I would defer to one of the other, my other panelists who probably are more familiar with that. 2018 on the Maryland shore, sir. Okay. On the shore? Yes, sir. And, and uh, animal control or this type of use of it never was labeled on the uh, product. Is that correct? Uh, Comar prohibited it in 1925. Yeah, <laughs> I thought so. Uh, 
How many eagles have been killed by uh, wind turbines in uh, Maryland? It, it, it is a large number as well, sir. <laughs> so I guess we better outlaw them too, huh? Well, there are, <clears throat> that is being considered uh, that the incidental take per provision of the Mike Herbert Treaty Act are under scrutiny. Uh, uh, and I don't know where that particular issue stands, sir. Oh, yeah, is not a wind turbine in your shed somewhere that you're hiding from us? I, actually, I do have a windmill used to pump water, but. Uh, <laughs> so I, I, well, I understand that those, any wind turbine blades, those wind turbine blades are gr great ways to store illegal carbon. So. <laughs> Um, Go ahead. You stop. got me. You got me confused. <laughs> I had another question, but is it not true that uh, we can legally um, possess carbofuran now? But if we move it somewhere in an automobile or a pickup truck or in a truck, uh, we're in violation of the law. Are you Aaron sure you're Walker. not talking about snare traps? <laughs> Maryland law prohibits that as well, sir. And has for quite a while. Uh huh. So it's just like the snare traps. Okay. Mm, Delegate Lehman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And and actually, you kind of just made my point. I'm wondering if someone can explain that disconnect between the ban and possession. If the ban was in 2009, were there not ever efforts before to address this issue of this um, substance being being stored? <laughs> And, e and EPA, second, e EPA took away, away its registration, didn't make it illegal to possess. The states can be more restrictive and do so. They didn't mandate to the registrar on FMC to buy back or um, take, <clears throat> give incentives to re uh, take the. Re uh, okay, and the, 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 uh, the Maryland the Department of Agriculture has done some voluntary. Uh, program allowing people to turn that in, but the last one I think was in 2011. Okay, and the second part of that question was, and I'm not sure if this got addressed and I didn't hear it, is do we know where those, um, for lack of better term, stockpiles exist? Do we know who has this stuff and where it is? Some search warrants that have, that have been done in conjunction with Eagle Deaths on shore have found them in close proximity to poisoning sites. Uh, <clears throat> It's up to the human <laughs> deviance, if you will, as to where they may be hidden or retained. Uh, they may not be open an open view for Maryland uh, for inspectors to see during their routine inspections. Okay, my, my last question quickly, Mr. Chairman, is for the sponsor. Um, Delegate Teresa, thank you for the bill. It's an interesting one. I think it's a good one. I'm just curious about what seems like a lengthy implementation period. I think it's 2023, 20, 24, um, where you mentioned various dates, but they're, they're at least um, two to three years off. Why is that? Why do we need so much time to address this? Yeah, I think others may also be able to address this, but I think it, because we don't know where all the stockpiles are, we know where it's been illegally used or near, the, nearby where it's been legally used, but we don't know where all those stockpiles are. And it's just to give people time since it's been legal to possess it for this long um, and to give the state the time to get up to speed and have a way to dispose of it. I don't know okay. if anybody else has a comment on that. It was, I think, just to give time. Okay, okay well, we'll, we'll find out from somebody somewhere the answer to that question. Um, Delegate, did, oh, Delegate Lehman, did you have another question or are you good? Okay. Um, Delegate Boyce. I think uh, Delegate uh, Lehman asked my question. I guess the curiosity of why there wasn't a buyback or a voluntary buyback program, you know, in, in 2009, given the the danger of this of this substance. So I I, I think um, Frank answered that a little bit. Um, I think you did you did cut in and out as you were answering it. So I didn't hear it on my end. Um, I'll, mention, uh, I'll respond, Delegate Voice. Um, thank you. As Frank said, the you know EPA took away the registration and left it to the states to further that enforcement. And so we basically, the states can handle that. So it's really up to us, and it really is in our in our lap to do it now here in the state of Maryland. 
So we didn't do anything about it. So well, I believe we did buy back. Um, Frank, were you saying we we did some buyback for a couple of years there, and then I think under a grant from the EPA, Maryland Department of Agriculture, on two two separate separate occasions. Yeah, I, I just I'm looking at Farm Bureau's testimony, and they said there was no buyback program. Maybe I'm sorry, it was a voluntary churn in program where Maryland would uh, would destroy the material appropriate. Got it. Thank you so much. Dr. Jacobs. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Uh, Kinser, um, do you have any idea how much uh, product is out there on the shelf? 1991 is the last year when there are records in Maryland. They sold 131,000 tons. There is no, there is no uh, accurate figure that I have seen in, in any literature uh, indicating how much is out there. So we really don't know how much is out there and you can't transport it the way the law is written now, correct? I'm sorry, Delegate uh, Jacobs, I did not hear you, sir. I say you can't transport it now uh, legally. You say- I'm Under Maryland law, that is correct. Right, and you don't know how much is out there. Um, and it's the state doesn't, and the state also doesn't have a program to get rid of, to get rid of, uh, farm chemicals, old chemicals that may be expired or whatever. They don't have a program, is that right? They do have a, a, a program, but uh, but they don't have a buyback program per se. The, uh, as I understand, I, I hate to speak for, for their inspectors authorities, but I do believe that if they're contacted according to one of their news releases last year, they will accept it and take, take care of it. Yeah, so, you know, just given all this information, don't you think it's a little strong to be all of a sudden make it illegal to possess it? If we've already got this, we don't have a program to get rid of. We don't know how much is out there. It's illegal to transport. Well, you know, don't you think it's a little strong to uh, then make it illegal to? Well, even can I answer that, that Chairman? Mr. Chairman? It, yeah, so, sure. So that's what this would do is have them set up that program because I think they have not had, I think they had a program, they haven't had a program functioning in a while and this would require them to set up that program. It's a very dangerous substance for both humans and wildlife. It's been used illegally and even when it's not used illegally, it's dangerous and it is, um, it is because starting to seep so that this would require a program to be set up and give several years for that to be fully implemented. So that if is- I may, if, I, if I may, folks, it's stored in the bags that it was purchased in. They're less than three millimeter, millimeter thick, that's three thousandths of an inch. And those are deteriorating over time, could be punctured, ruptured, spread, spread throughout wherever they're located. So the hazard as it relates to that is very acute. Thank you. Hey, uh, Jay, you good? Or do you have another question? Uh, no, that's it. Okay. Um, Delegate Boyce, do you have another question? Go for it. A, a quick follow-up. So if there are people who've been having the stuff stored, what is the shelf life of this stuff? Like, does it become less potent as it's held on? What's the, what is, what is the like, shelf life? The material itself is, is 50 year shelf life. The, Ooh, okay. The, that's all I need to know. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I think that's the end of the questions for the sponsor and the support of the bill. Let's turn to the opponent, um, uh, Colby Ferguson, on behalf of the Maryland Farm Bureau. Colby. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Um, I guess I'm probably the only one that um, is testifying in opposition to this bill orally as well as written. But um, it's not that we're in opposition of getting this product off of the uh, off out of farmers' uh, sheds and and not really just farmer sheds, but um, you know grandfathers that have a garage full of uh, old chemicals that they used back in the 50s, 60s, 70s that um, just sit on the shelf and and what happens is is that it sits there and then the next generation takes over the house and and the next thing you know you have these chemicals that they don't even know they don't even know how to pronounce the name much less. Um, get know what they're used for and 
Um, carbifuran specifically is a was a or still is a restricted use pesticide. So when it was uh, deregistered in 2009, uh, a farmer that was allowed or legal to use it at that time couldn't use it anymore because uh, it would violate their restricted use pesticide license. So if they were to use it and, and were found using it, they would lose their license. So no different than what uh, we did with chlorpyrifos this past year. Uh, now that it's banned, it would be in the exact same boat. We're just a year into it now. Um, so what the problem of it is, is that there, there is a sometimes used uh, voluntary program. Um, I know that back in 2018, when we had the issue with the eagle deaths, uh, Maryland Department of Agriculture did put out a voluntary program and they did collect product. And I don't believe we've had a documented uh, eagle kill since because I think farmers had no idea that it would kill eagles. Um, and so uh, I think we had a lot of product. And so my worry is, is that now we have a $1,500 and $4,000 fine uh, being created and we're, we're bringing in NRP to now come in and start uh, uh, inspecting and seizing chemicals that they really don't know what they mean. And so uh, we, we object to the way this bill is all drafted, but I think we understand the intent just would maybe have some issues with uh, the, uh, the part of the NR and the enforcement part. Uh, okay. Um, any questions for uh, Mr. Ferguson? So I'm sorry, I didn't hear the lap tail end of your statement. I mean, if we reduce the fine, could you guys be okay with it? I think the biggest concern is is bringing natural resources police into this. They don't inspect. I mean, they're they're in for wildlife. Um, you know, if you're hunting, fishing, those kinds of things, to now bring them in and have them be experts on which chemicals are allowed, which ones aren't, which ones should be seized. I mean, I, I even asked DNR this back um, uh, uh, last week if, if they would have issues with this, and I don't know if they submitted any, any written testimony, but um, the Natural Resources Police said that they would, they, they would have some concerns with ha being... Uh, yeah, uh, James McKittrick uh, offered us some informational written testimony. We'll have to re read that. Who would you prefer if not DNR? Well, I think, you know, obviously the, the Maryland Department of Agriculture is the regulatory agency. They're the one who enforces uh -huh. what we use and, and enforces the law. So it should stay within MDA. Um, I'm sure they're going to sit there and say they have no money either, but um, we never have any money. But uh, the problem we have is, is that they don't offer these programs for farmers to get rid of these old products. And honestly, that's what we really need. If you wanted to, this bill sit there and said that MDA needed to put these programs out on an annual basis, what we call, we do a tire amnesty program right now for farm tires. There should be a chemical, uh, a farm chemical amnesty pro, um, day that where we could collect these and get these off the shelves. But you know, I Colby, I, I, I would love to make this bill look in a way that farmers could support. Uh, you're, you're willing to, you've always been willing to work with us in the past. So do you think that's possible? Oh yeah, I mean, we don't, I, I, <laughs> I'm not going to sit here and support somebody that uses carbifuran after it's been gone for 11 years and not been not allowed to be used. So, and it's not even being used for its intended use. It was to use to be on on soybeans to take care of aphids. It's not used to kill groundhogs that then end up getting eaten by an eagle and uh, kills an eagle. So, it's not even being used for its intended pur purpose anymore. So, yeah, I'm not going to defend anybody that uses it wrong. I just think okay. we have to get okay. it off the shelf. Okay, I think the sponsor has a question. Maybe a delegate voice, but oh no, you put your hand down. Okay. Mr. Mr. Chairman, I don't really have a question per se, although if you want me to phrase it as a question, I can, but I'm more than happy to work with them. I think the intent with DNR was just to have them involved if there's wildlife um, killed or um, are there's some illegal use of it that is evidenced. I, I mean, I think the department- Well, well delegate, I, I think I'm happy to we work can- with them. Yeah, okay. Well, I, I think we can work in a way that'll make everybody happy. Yeah, I'm more than happy to work with them on that. Okay, great. Well, there appear to be no further questions for House Bill 1025, so that ends that public hearing. Let's proceed in, in now to House Bill 1069, Delegate Stewart. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, greetings to you and, and uh, Vice Chair Stein. For the record, I am Delegate Vaughn Stewart. This is HB 1069. So 2 million Marylanders currently rely on private wells for their drinking water, but while water quality protections for these wells are few and far between. 
Um, in fact, according to a recent report from the Center for Progressive Reform, our state offers fewer protections for private wells than almost any other state in the country. The most worrying contaminant that can get in these private wells are nitrates. Uh, since they're odorless, they're colorless, they're tasteless, nitrates often go unnoticed, but high nitrate levels in drinking water are linked to a condition called blue baby syndrome, which is fatal to infants. They're also associated with cancers and with pregnancy complications. And in some parts of the state, as much as five or 10% of private wells probably contain alarming levels of at least nitrates, if not other contaminants. And this problem is especially pronounced in communities of color on the shore. And yet residents are largely in the dark about these risks or the safety of their wells. So HB 1069 would create a well safety program that helps to cover the cost of the testing and the remediation of contaminated wells. For many affected families with these wells, the 100 bucks it costs to test a well, and especially the roughly 500 or so dollars it costs to remediate any contamination is prohibitively expensive. Um, I just wanna first uh, just cover some of the opposition testimony that you're here. It really comes in two varieties, but I think that we can address the outstanding concerns with some sponsor amendments. So first, the realtors, the builders, and the judiciary are concerned with the funding mechanism, which would require an average homeowner when purchasing a home with a private well to pay a small fee of 50 or 75 bucks. Um, the realtors, uh, and you know, they have concerns about sort of raising the, the cost of buying a home. Uh, the realtors have instead suggested using the Bay Restoration Fund, which has an existing surplus, which could fund the, this well water program for decades. Um, but I know that will probably engender a controversy with the Chesapeake um, Bay, the, the CBF. Um, so I'll, I'll, you know, I'm, ag I'm agnostic on the funding mechanism. Uh, I think either source would work, but I'm, I'm going to continue working with um, the opponents and other groups to see where we can find this money so that we can fund this program. Um, and then the realtors also had another objection about no notifying homeowners about uh, contaminated wells. I'm happy to strike that provision, and I've already drafted a sponsor amendment to do that. Uh, secondly, you're going to hear from county health departments concerned about the burden the bill would place on them. And this issue is really on me in drafting the bill. The current version is uh, the bill is, is inconsistent with the intent. Um, and basically the bill currently requires county health departments to conduct soil testing and then submit those results for analysis from the Maryland Department of Health. We're really not trying to impose any additional costs on county health departments. Once the funding for the testing and the remediation is used up, uh, we just want it to run out. You know, we don't want the county health departments to be responsible for the difference in available funding with requested funding. So I'm going to submit another sponsor amendment to clarify this issue and to make it clear that uh, the county health departments are not responsible for any soil testing. And I think that'll resolve any concerns. And then from them, and then the last, lastly, on the fiscal note, um, right now it basically says that the uh, transfer fee would generate $800,000 for homeowner testing and remediation. It says that MDE would have about $400,000 in administrative costs. And it says that the Maryland Department of Health would have about $700,000 in administrative costs. So just to be clear, um, this change that I just referenced about county health department soil testing and submitting the results to, to MDH, removing that removes the $700,000 from the fiscal note and gets us back into the, into the black, into the positive on the fiscal note. And so I'm gonna continue working uh, to, to figure out how we get that, that remaining fund so we can both provide funding to homeowners and also for administrative costs. And in conclusion, Mr. Chairman, safe drinking water is a human right and we must ensure that Marylanders have access to it. This program would be a modest but important step in that direction and I urge a favorable report. Okay, um, the following people are signed up in favor of the bill. Jean Holloway, Daria Minovi, Emily Ranson, Brent Walls, uh, Brendan uh, Mascarenas is um, signed up favorable with amendments. So let's start with uh, Jean Holloway and then Daria Minovi. Jean? Good afternoon. Uh, and as the chairman said, I'm Jean Holloway. I'm the state manager for the Southeast Rural Community Assistance Project, or CIRCAP, Delaware and Eastern Maryland office. We're located in Frankfort, Delaware. I'm also a licensed water operator in the state of Delaware and a Worcester County, Maryland resident and uh, uh, a private well owner. Um, CIRCAP, just to give you some background, is a nonprofit technical assistance and training organization, and we serve from Delaware down to Florida. Our office has had a program in Delaware for the last two years. 
providing workshop and free well testing kits for individual wells. Um, these same two bottle testing kits are available any time of the year for $4, but we found that when we offered them for free, people literally came out of the woodwork. We gave out over 180 well test kits uh, in the space of less than five months. Uh, it, this financial incentive, just the word free, seemed to increase interest. And by that, we increased interest in people learning about their wells and why they should be testing. We learned a couple of things in these first two years that not only is there a need, which we knew, but also a demand, especially in areas of, of agriculture and industrial activity where contaminants might be more prevalent. A lot of well owners think their water is fine if it tastes good but they have no idea what to periodically test for or why. They may complain about iron, but iron as pathogens go is not particularly harmful. On a personal level, my own well has not been tested since 1995. And I'm pretty ashamed to even say that as a water professional, but even knowing what I do, the cost of testing my well every year has been prohibitive. Uh, I see my time is running down, but um, just, just to, to conclude, um, a free or low cost water testing program encourages people to learn about their wells and the potential harm of uh, long-term exposure to contaminants like nitrates that you can't taste, see, or smell. And as a water professional and as a Maryland resident, I wholeheartedly support uh, HB 1069 to create such a program. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, uh, Daria Minovi and Emily Ransom will be next after her. Daria. Hi, my name is Daria Minovi. I'm a policy analyst at CPR here in support of uh, House Bill 1069. While the Safe Drinking Water Act's protections don't extend to private wells, many states have adopted protective policies. Last year, we completed a national scan of 10 key programs that states have implemented to protect private well owners. This includes things like subsidizing the cost of test kits, operating a public database of well records, and requiring that landlords notify tenants of water testing results. In Maryland, once a well is deemed safe for household use, it's up to the well owner to maintain it. And outside of a few basic requirements, there's no systematic effort at the state level to ensure the ongoing safety of wells. Nationwide, this isn't the norm. In our scan, we found that Maryland ranked as one of the five states with the fewest protective policies. The lack of protections is not only outdated, but it might also be harming public health. Last year, we also assessed nitrate, a colorless and tasteless contaminant in private wells on the Lower Eastern Shore. Common sources of nitrate are excess application of manure and fertilizer to fields and septic system drainage. We found that one in 25 wells in Wicomico and Worcester counties had nitrate levels above EPA's safe drinking water threshold. Now, high nitrate levels are known to cause blue baby syndrome, a condition fatal to infants. They're also linked to an increased risk of cancer, pregnancy complications, and thyroid disease. A recent study found an association between well water usage and cancer among private well owners on the Lower Shore. In a 2020 poll of Lower Shore residents, nearly three quarters of private well owners stated they'd never tested their well water or hadn't done so in the last year, even though the state recommends testing annually. The most common explanation for testing was, I didn't know I needed to. Furthermore, 40% of respondents said they'd never heard of nitrates, and most notably, the survey showed that lower income residents were less likely to test their wells. While the state, uh, with not regularly monitoring groundwater and well owners not equipped with the necessary resources and information to safeguard their drinking water, the state is jeopardizing the health of nearly 2 million Marylanders who rely on well water. There's a very real public health concern that can be addressed now. The what you don't know won't hurt you approach is no longer working. We urge the legislature to give state agencies and counties the resources needed to step up and ensure that safe drinking water is a right for all Marylanders, not just those who rely on public utilities to adopt a favorable report on the bill. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, next, Emily Ranson, followed by Brent Walls. Hi, Chairman Barbe, members of the committee. I am Emily Ranson with Clean Water Action, here not to talk about septic systems. We're talking about wells today. Uh, so, uh, as you all know, usually we are here talking about septic systems, but where you have septic systems, you typically um, also are talking about people who are uh, drinking well water. And just like a septic system, well health is the responsibility of the homeowner. And for many people, this is not something that they know. Um, unlike if you drink from the public system, all of the responsibility for testing your water to make sure that it is meeting uh, drinking water standards, that is up to um, that homeowner. 
And aside from that initial test, uh, when the well is being drilled or when the home is being sold or certain uh, qualifying events happen, there is not uh, sufficient state oversight here to make sure that these tests are accessible, that they are happening. And one thing that we really like about this piece of legislation is that it includes that database. This is information that is happening. And so while we are getting some of this information, it would be great if we had a centralized system so that way the state could better track where we have hot spots uh, where one well fails because of contamination. There is a chance that that point of contamination is happening in wells in that same area. It could be from industrial pollution, could be from a failing septic system. It could be, you know, who knows? But where one well is suffering, it is a good chance that there could be other wells in that area, all tapping from that same um, well groundwater system. And we do want to then also mention that there are several different threats to drinking water, especially groundwater. And in Maryland, one that we are seeing increasingly is actually salt. Um, so definitely something important to keep in mind. So thank you, and we urge a favorable report. Okay, thank you very much. Next up is Brent Walls, followed by uh, Brendan Muscarenas. Uh, so Brent. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, my name is Brent Walls, and I'm speaking as a constituent in Washington County and as the Upper Potomac Riverkeeper. As a small farm owner, we depend on clean water for our horses. For the past seven years, we have experienced horrible water quality. Uh, we have spent money on UV filters because of the bacteria and sediment filters changed almost weekly for seven years. My wife and I purchased the home in 2014 and because the loan was through the VA, we had to have the water sample done of the well. The results came back high with bacteria, but nitrogen was not a requirement for the testing. Um, it's, uh, it, and in fact, only VA loan requires the well water to be tested for bacteria before the mortgage company can secure the loan. No other loan company nor the health department require a well to be tested at the time of a sale. Last November, just before Thanksgiving, our well failed. Our horses, pets, four kids had to live off of a water tank truck while the well company prepared to drill a new well. After two months, we have a new well at a cost of $18,000. Um, there are no public records available that can inform prospective homeowners uh, about the well water quality. It is upsetting that private well homeowners do not have any way of checking on the quality of water for private wells. As a riverkeeper, I've communicated with Washington County Health Department officials asking about quality of the groundwater for thousands of the private homes. The health department says, Although they do have some testing results, they are not required to make them publicly available, nor are they comprehensive for all private wells in the county. <clears throat> it is to the homeowner at the time of the sale or during their time at the property to test their own well water, which is not cheap, nor do many residents even understand what should be tested. And fixing your water problems is even more expensive. In many cases, well water problems never get fixed, and so people continue to drink polluted water without knowing it. Washington County officials uh, have recognized there are significant water quality issues in, with the groundwater and are in the process of asking MD to conduct a groundwater assessment. Um, however, that has not um, uh, transpired. So I am requesting uh, a favorable report on House Bill 1069. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, well, uh, signed up favorable with amendments is Brendan Moscarenas with the American Chemistry Council. Are you uh, with us? Uh, yes. Hello, I am. Um, hopefully the uh, audio is working. Um, yeah, just I can see you and hear you. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, my name is Brendan Mascarinas on behalf of the American Chemistry Council. Um, we, are, uh, we recognize that the, the challenges uh, that Maryland faces in, in providing safety in private wells and drinking water supply for, for up to 13% of state residents uh, what we believe that the fund established by the uh, provisions in, in 1069 and the, the grants that it's creating are an important step in uh, addressing the state's efforts to, to ensure that drinking water supply. Uh, we are favorable uh, in, in support of the bill with a couple uh, um, amendments to it. Um, the first amendment would just clarify uh, that the test methods used should be EPA uh, approved and analytical methods. Um, or approved by a similar state process. Um, that validation helps to ensure that the results are accurate and reproducible um, and helps to, to minimize any false positives or negative results. 
Um, we also suggest a second um, uh, amendment to the inclusion of, of other contaminants in section H26 uh, of part one. We suggest that that be revised to limit the scope of substances for which applicable for, for which acceptable levels have been properly defined. Um, we've suggested that the inclusion of those contaminants for which a health advisory has been established under the Safe Drinking Water Act, um, but there may be separate reviews uh, that the state could conduct that would also be comparable to that, um, which, which we would support as well. Um, so thank you for your attention today and, and happy to answer any questions. Okay, um, we have a couple of questions. First, Delegate Boyce, then Delegate um, Clark. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. I, uh, and this is for the sponsor or anyone else. Um, and I'm sorry for my ignorance. Um, is there an actual repository of wells across the state? Like, is there a list somewhere that you can look up and say that X property has a well, had a well? Because um, sometimes this comes up in, in even my district, you know, there's a community post and somebody's digging in the backyard and they found an old well. So I'm, I'm curious about that. Yeah, that's a good question. I think I know the answer, but Dari, if I could kick it to you on that, because I, I, I don't want to misstate it. Yeah, I, um, I was able to get a database of wells from MDE through uh, an information act request. Um, so it listed- It's well not public. It is not public. No, that one, that was something that I had to request. I, I did not come across any other sort of public database. So some of the realtors might have a better sense of that. Um, but I, yeah, I didn't see anything. And is someone from it, there? It looks like Jean actually might right. be able to answer that. Uh, just, uh, well, I'm not sure yes. whether I can answer it, but um, after a certain date, I believe sometime in the 1970s, wells were required to have a tag that stayed permanently with the well that stated the permit number, the well driller, and so forth. So a private homeowner, if they knew where to look, could look at that tag. However, what we find in our work is that frequently the tag gets thrown away or taken off. People don't recognize its importance. Um, and that happened to my daughter, in fact. So uh, so it's, it's not recorded with, with, with a deed, for instance? No. It's, it's, it's usually something that, that should be, but isn't. And a lot of it is out of ignorance and people not knowing why they should think about that well tag. I've come across them where they've been painted over and you can't read them. So there's all kinds of reasons why they either don't exist or they're not, not deciphered. So I'm hearing two issues that may lend itself to the bigger issue is that we don't have a public listing of where wells are and deeds don't necessarily record um, wells or the past presence of a, of a well on a property. Correct. After, especially if it was put in before uh, sometime, I think it was 1983 sticks in my mind. And um, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Dar um, Daria, you said that MD, you had to get a Public Information Act to get that information. And so is MDE on the No, I guess I don't see them. Okay, so I just I'm just curious why that's not something um, publicly put out there. It seems like we could reach more people if we actually knew um, where this stuff was. Um, thanks for the bill, um, Delegate Stewart. Okay, um, Delegate Clark has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this is for the delegate, uh, the sponsor of the bill. Uh, Delegate Stewart, uh, today's a fine day because it may be a day that I may agree with the bill that uh, that you put in. So uh, I thought you might. Uh, having lived with the well most of my life, I, I know uh, some of the things that you're talking about there. But one one statement you made that concerned me a little bit. Maybe you can uh, clarify a little bit for me. Uh, you were talking about the use of possible use of pay restoration funds uh, to help with this project. I personally can't think of any better use now that we've upgraded the major's uh, water and sewer plants that, than to use a uh, bay restoration fund for something like this. But you stated that CBF may not, uh, and I like that, the CBF controlled the bay restoration funds? That's a well, that's a good question. I don't think that they control the funds, but they certainly I know that they have testified in opposition before about bills that have tried to use the best day restoration fund for other purposes. 
Um, I, my, my, basically what I was, what I was saying is that they're about, according to our research, there's about $50 million in surplus right now in the Bay Restoration Fund. Now that they've got, and as you say, most of the projects going forward are going to be more of the minor, uh, the minor ones. And so, uh, you know, the realtor said that that would be a more viable source of funding than what we had currently devised, which was essentially what we current, what, what we, what we previously devised or, or initially uh, devised. It was essentially a well insurance program where when you bought a home, you'd pay a little bit of a fee, but then you could draw from the fund. So, yeah, it's a, not unlike sort of a health insurance or, you know, car insurance sort of risk pool situation. Um, but they, you know, they drew our attention to the Bay Restoration Fund. And obviously, I'll sort of I'll sort of leave it to the subcommittee or to the committee to decide, you know, the best use. I think this this program would be extremely essential to fund but I will be kind of agnostic on the best way to do it. So basically, so basically it's like the uh, ag and bay tags. Uh, if anybody wants to have a license plate to celebrate the biotech industry, uh, the Chesapeake Bay Trust will testify against it because it takes money away from the bay tag. Basically, exactly. It is. exactly. Yeah. And, and I have not spoken with CBF about that because honestly, we did not seriously consider this option until the realtors brought it to our attention. So I have not discussed that with them. I'm only guessing that they would oppose, but I actually cannot confirm that. I, I can't imagine that they, they would oppose something for the health and welfare of the citizens of the state of Maryland who pay that fund $30 or, or however many it is every year on their tax bill. And for people now, I do believe, and wouldn't you say it would be essential that if we did use these funds to do these testing on these wells, there would be some need to be some time of a means test put in place so that we weren't going around testing um, uh, wells for people that would have absolutely no problem whatsoever doing that. Uh, we did that in the bill. when we first started doing nitrogen removal with Bay Restoration Funds, there was no means test. And we were put subsidizing people with millions and millions of dollars to put in new nitrogen removal systems. Now, wouldn't you say that would be an issue? Yeah, no, I think you and I are in 100% agreement. So right now in the bill, we already say that the funding, the fund should prioritize low-income folks who are struggling to pay this amount, and there should be a means test. You know, now obviously, if not enough people, the outreach is not very great, and not enough people apply for the funding, then it's possible the funds will flow to people of more modest or higher incomes, just depending on the demand. But the priority in the bill is given to people who can't otherwise afford. And, okay. and just one, just one last question. Uh, I, I have to. Don't you think it, it's pretty smart of me that I test my well every year and have it chlorinated throughout my whole house? Uh, but think, I have. I have. We have money. nothing. We have nothing but the highest regard for you, Elliot Clark. That, that's Positively brilliant. Smart, Positively isn't it? brilliant. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. All right, let's, um, uh, if there are no further questions for the supporters of the bill, uh, let's move to the opponents of the bill, and they would be many. Uh, Lisa May, Sarah Trescott, Matt, Matt Cummer, uh, Matthew Cummers, uh, Don, Donald Curtin, uh, Barry Glotfelty. I think that's it. So let's start with Lisa May and Sarah Trescott. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Lisa May of the aforementioned Maryland Realtors um, speaking opposition to the bill. Uh, as was mentioned by Delegate Stewart, um, we are opposed to the imposition um, of a, another tax on home sales to fund this program. Uh, it was in testimony before this committee about two weeks ago that we came up with the idea of um, using some of the surplus funds in the Bay Restoration Fund uh, for this program. And it was estimated that that totaled around 40 to $60 million a year, depending on um, what other uses uh, were proposed during legislation this session. Um, it's an existing revenue source. It's dedicated to water quality issues. It just seemed like a natural fit um, but beyond the funding source, um, as Delegate Stewart mentioned, we do have some concerns just with the technical aspects of how these tests would take place and play out during a home sales process um, for mortgage approval, 
um, whether we have the capacity both within the uh, public and private sectors to conduct the number of tests that would be required and whether that would introduce delays um, into a property sale. Um, however, we've had very productive conversations um, with the delegate. We are happy to continue to do more because we do believe that a well testing program, particularly in those hotspot areas that were mentioned in this bill, has a lot of, um, and as Ms. Holloway said, a free or low cost well test is beneficial to homeowners. So it is just our hope that we can work through all of those issues and get to a place uh, where we can remove our opposition to the bill as written today. Thank you. Okay, next let's go to Sarah Trescott uh, with uh, uh, Matt up next. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Vice Chair, and committee members. I'm Sarah Trescott, representing the Maryland Conference of Local Environmental Health Directors, and thank you for allowing me to testify today. Our conference strongly and fully supports the enhanced public health aspects of this bill. However, the overall implementation process concerns us. The proposed bill requires the department to develop a private well safety program and a well surveillance program. The well safety program is funded through a special property transfer tax for property served by private wells. However, the well surveillance program does not identify a means of funding. It is an unfunded mandate to local jurisdictions with associated cost that could exceed hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not millions statewide. According to the Maryland Realtors website, there were approximately 96,000 homes sold in 2020. MDE's website indicates about 13% of Maryland residents obtained their drinking water from private wells. Although revenues would be generated from the 0.0231% special transfer tax on homes sold with private wells, it must support both the operational and administrative cost of the well safety program for those counties willing to participate in the grants. However, when the housing market fluctuates, these funds would decrease and decrease availability of funds to the local jurisdiction and potential homeowners who may be dependent on those funds. As my colleagues will describe in their testimony, the well surveillance program is not funded and is costly to local health which is already overwhelmed with increased responsibilities due to the pandemic and difficulties in recruiting and sustaining licensed environmental health specialist employees. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Matt, you're next. Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chairman and distinguished members of the committee. My name is Matt Cummers. I'm also with the Conference of Environmental Health Directors. And I, I want to first state that um, we're not opposed to a private well safety program at all, and we think that there's great merit uh, to this idea and this concept, but uh, we, we do think that uh, it's, there's more work that's needed to be done, you know, uh, to, to refine this into a, into a uh, viable solution. So first of all, I want to talk about the importance of certifications and professionalism uh, in this entire process. So there's a lot of talk about low cost and, and home test kits et cetera. In Maryland, we have a program and all the water samplers who submit water samples for analysis in the state of Maryland have to be certified and licensed. Uh, so just a homeowner filling a bottle is, is really the integrity is not there. Uh, there. There are a lot of chain of custody issues that uh, really need to be discussed and, and further you know, developed here in this bill. So uh, that's we are suggesting that this go to work group so that uh, all these details can be hashed out. Uh, there's also a lot of issue with uh, certification of those who are making decisions about uh, well private wells as well as uh, making decisions about the quality of you know the analysis so there may be private samples that are submitted um, what were those private samples analyzed in accordance with current comar and you know there's going to be need there's going to need to be professionals who actually review and analyze those things those are environmental health specialists they have to be licensed to the state of Maryland and like uh, Lou pointed out, there's a shortage of those folks, and it's really hard to recruit and retain people in that profession. So the burden on local health departments is substantial, um, and, and the funding mechanisms, you know, are, are in question. But it's also a matter of how these things are done, so maintaining integrity in the process is critical. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, next, Donald Curtin. 
Hi, I'm uh, Don Curtian. Uh, the, I'm also with the Conference of uh, Environmental Health Directors. And uh, again, uh, we do support the public health in, uh, intent of this bill, um, but there are some concerns. And one of the, the issues that I wanna discuss is the cost of sampling and surveillance across the state. Recently in Anne Arundel County, we took on a project to look at the, uh, the impact of increased development on a very small peninsula that's four, foot, four miles long by two miles wide uh, and analyzed um, new development in that area. This is an area that's served by a lot of existing shallow wells and based on um, our analysis and uh, our surveillance, we found that the increased development was gonna have a bigger impact on those existing wells and draw in some brackish water and cause some saltwater intrusion issues. So from that survey, we, we put drilling restrictions on any new development and any new wells that now had to drill down to a deeper aquifer, which increased the, the cost to the development of those sites, but it protected the existing groundwater from any impact. And that cost alone for that very small area was $200,000. So the concern with this bill is the cost to do all the surveillance and sampling across the state. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Um, next, uh, let's go to Barry uh, Glotfelty. Barry? Can you hear me? Uh, I can hear you and see you. Okay, uh, thank you, Chairman and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Barry Glotfelty, and uh, like my other directors, I do find it difficult to uh, testify against a bill that is titled uh, uh, well safety program, because um, we are all dedicated to well safety in our profession. Um, I just want to touch on a couple of technical aspects of the bill that I think are problematic in terms of turning this into a workable uh, bill as currently written, and that's with uh, MCL requirements. In a couple of cases, uh, MCL requirements are going to be problematic in this bill. Um, MCLs really are initially uh, promulgated for public water systems. And wells are a little different because they're a, a, actually a more reliable source of water. So uh, for instance, an MCL for total coliform bacteria talks about 5% of the samples can't contain total coliform. And that reflects how many samples are done for uh, public water systems and, and treated systems. So with wells, we may collect three or four total coliform samples in the course of approving a well for a water supply. And we may wind up with not being able to eliminate total coliform from a well, um, but still approve it as a potable water supply with treatment. Um, but I, I, as I read the bill, it would talk about that well would be designated as a hotspot after we have approved it as a potable supply. And the same thing applies for uh, turbidity. Uh, where public systems are looking at turbidity as already treated water. And we're looking at the turbidity sta standard as something that could be treated. Uh, but once again, that may put that well as a hot spot where we have said it's a potable supply. And then the other standard for radon really seems to be an air quality standard. Um, and actually for drinking water, it's probably several magnitudes of order higher uh, where that becomes a problem. If you could wrap up your testimony, the committee would appreciate it, and I know they have questions. Uh, that, that, was, that, was, that was it. Thank you. Uh, thank, thanks to the committee for the time. Okay, so uh, the first question goes to Jerry Clark. Doug Clark? Or was your hand up from the last yeah, question? Now I raise again. His question for uh, Mr. Comer. Matt Comer? Yeah, go yes, ahead. Yes, sir. <laughs> okay, um, Matt, uh, when you say that uh, there is, there's not enough licensed individuals, when people get their water tested in, in Calvary County now, do they go to bring their water sample to the health department or do they take it to a private uh, entity? Well, that's a great point. Uh, great question. And, the, and there are both, it can happen both ways. 
So uh, the health department can conduct sam sampling and the analysis of that sampling can go to the Maryland Department of Health Laboratory or it can also be done by private certified individuals um, and sent to private certified water quality laboratories. A lot of it happens through private uh, entities. So absolutely. And so would you say that by using private entities that it maybe you wouldn't clarify it as being as safe as going through the health department? But would you say it was 80 percent, 90 percent is good? Well, I'm, I'm actually not trying to disparage the private entities in any way. I, I wasn't really trying. That wasn't what I was getting at. Um, I actually think because our program is robust, we have certification. These individuals are held to, uh, you know, the, the same standards that health department samplers are held to. I think that there's a lot of integrity in the in the process as it stands. What I was saying is that, like, there would not be that same integrity with uh, with like home test kits, you know, these cheap uh, yeah. solutions that were brought up. And so, you know, I, I, the way it's happening now, the way you get your well tested, I think there's a high degree of integrity. And, and I think that, uh, that that's something we have to keep in mind when, when this legislation is discussed is that uh, at home test kits to report those results uh, as, as matter of fact, when they weren't collected by certified individuals is very problematic. And I think, you know, may paint a picture. I mean, uh, a lot of the people involved in these, uh, testing and this testing, especially when you require it for real estate or for tenant uh, landlord issues, I, I definitely think that there's a possibility that the integrity of the process is not in, uh, maintained. Um, you know, with certain people have certain interest in the results being one way or another. You know, so so I guess what I'm saying is, as long as the sampling is done by certified individuals uh, and the water quality testing is done by certified laboratories, there will be integrity. Um, but, but I also there's, want to bring up the fact that I was talking about recruitment and retention. Uh, the sampling results need to be analyzed. So there needs to be an analysis and a breakdown to say, yes, this is acceptable. We do that for existing certificates of potability right now. And all of our environmental health specialists have to take a look at those private lab results and or our results and say, yes, have we covered all the bases? Has this been done in accordance with current COMAR regulations? And, uh, and so there, there's that element that's really not being discussed that that there has to be that oversight. And, you know, that, that's done at the local health level. Um, and that there's a lot of, there is staffing and, and time, and these are professionals that have to know what they're doing. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you for your years of service to Coward County. Thank you, Delegate. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Delegate Boyce, Stewart, and Ruth in that order. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. I actually had a question from the last panel, but I think it's still relevant to this panel. Um, especially as it relates to funding. So Gene, you mentioned that before back in the day, folks would have their wells permitted and tagged. Who administered that program and was to do so and was there a fee? I don't, I can't speak to the fee. It was kind of before my tenure, but to my knowledge, when um, the regulations came in, it was done on the county health department level. Um, and the permit was issued by the county health department. Okay, I'm really um, a little disappointed that um, MDE isn't here to ask some questions. Um, I guess that was just my, my thought about where, um, what happened to that process, was there a fee for that process? Mm -hmm. And um, considering there doesn't seem to be a public database, um, you know, MDE has it, it'd be curious to know what, if there was a fee, what that fee was used for. And um, if it still exists, could that fee potentially be used to kind of start this back up so we can have an accounting, a real accounting of, of wells and also potentially pay for this program. So that, that is the question. Um, I, be, I believe that MDE has to approve the water appropriation, the withdrawal from the aquifer. Uh, and then the County Health Department issues the well permit of potability. Okay, but, so there is records if people are appropriately permitting their wells, there is a file record of those who've had permitted wells. Yes, okay, thank you. Well, it's Stewart. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. So I think this may be the first time in my three sessions that I've actually basically agreed with every single thing the opponents of my own bill have said. Um, so I think we're actually all in agreement on everything. So I actually first all kind of want to apologize from all the folks in the county health departments 
that I made them come out here and write testimony and and oppose the bill on a on a, the provision on sampling and on um, surveillance that I am more than happy to take out of the bill. It was never my intention to put that that burden on them to begin with. So I actually just want to apologize. And my question is just a clarifying one, which is that assuming that we take that piece out um, to, to all the, the folks from the, the local health departments, um, are y'all are y'all okay with the rest of the bill? I yeah, go ahead. Delegate Short. I think we would like to see it um, uh, kind of discussed in a work group situation so we can uh, kind of look at all the aspects of the bill and well, the bill, the, the, bill, the bill is going to a subcommittee. That's going to be its next step. And that's sort of a work group. So, yeah, I'm happy to invite y'all to the subcommittee meeting and get your thoughts and make, and, and I, obviously I would want y'all to sign off on any of the amendments that I propose, but I think we can house this sampling and I mean, just take the whole sampling surveillance thing out, make sure y'all have no additional burdens and the bill still does exactly what I want it to. So I'm, I don't think it'll be very tough for us to get on the same page, but I just wanted to make sure that, that y'all agree with that. Well, I think I'd say uh, that we're really looking forward to further discussing this. And I know uh, we've spoken to Alex with Mako and uh, and we may be having a conversation in the near future. So I'm really looking forward to, uh, to, to dialing this in and, and, you know, getting, getting it to a point where uh, uh, everyone is happy with it and, and this moves forward. So great. Well, I appreciate y'all's willingness to, to chat about it. I'm sorry that I didn't reach out to you. Uh, sooner to forestall any, you know, any wasted time. And then also thanks to Miss May for the, the helpful um, suggestions as well from the realtor. So with that, Mr. Chairman, I'm, I'm pleased. Okay. Uh, delegate, um, that seems to be the last question for the opponents. So uh, that ends the public hearing on House Bill 1069. Let's move to House Bill 1094, Delegate Ruth. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, the, uh, my name is Sheila Ruth. I'm, I'm here uh, with presenting House Bill 1094. Um, this bill was requested by the Baltimore County Executive. Uh, as we on this committee know well, waste is an increasing problem um, for local jurisdictions. The landfills are filling up and running out of space, but, but landfilling is not a great solution anyway, and we need to come up with other solutions as well. The recycling markets are not as well developed as we need them to be. Deconstructing food waste is a major contributor to the climate crisis, yet there is limited ability to divert organic waste in Maryland, as we have been discussing. Plastic waste is breaking down into microplastic particles, which can now be found anywhere on earth, including in humans and animals. Um, each of the local jurisdictions is working on finding solutions to the problem of what to do with our waste but there are advantages to working in regionally. Economies of scale can lead to cost savings. Recycling markets may be easier to develop with greater output of multiple jurisdictions. Um, the counties in Baltimore City working together along with other stakeholders may be better able to find creative solutions. So HB 1094 creates a work group to evaluate the establishment of a regional waste uh, disposal facility to serve Anne Arundel County, Baltimore City, Baltimore County, Carroll County, Harford County, and Howard County. The work group will include, include representatives of each of these jurisdictions, as well as representatives of other stakeholders and experts. Um, I've I met with um, representatives of uh, Zero Waste Coalition. Um, following that discussion, I've submitted amendments that clarify that the intent of the bill is for the work group to look at the problem of waste holistically and to focus on diversion as well as disposal. Um, uh, the work group will report on various items, including siting of a new regional waste diversion and disposal facility, um, cost sharing, developing markets and networks, consolidation, phasing out incineration, focusing on recycling, reuse and composting and advancing the principles of zero waste. And so I request a favorable report on HB 1094. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we have a number of people signed up in favor. Uh, Steve Lafferty. Um, uh, oh, just Steve. Steve, welcome back to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Vice Chair, members of the committee I'm here today on behalf of County Executive uh, John Oshevsky. Uh, full support of House Bill 1094. 
to really address a simple premise, which is that waste disposal is a growing challenge and regional solutions have to be taken into account in central Maryland. Uh, and the challenges of waste reduction, diversion, and disposal are certainly not new to you. Uh, the committee spent a lot of time last summer looking at composting and recycling, plastics, in recognition that if we don't divert more trash and, and waste uh, into other ways, instead of simply incinerating where we're causing more pollution and creating more environmental injustices, or just filling up landfills, we're really not anticipating the changing need of technology to be put into place to really help us move forward. And all of the solutions are not simple, the solutions are not simple and often very expensive. So by banding together in a collective way in the central area of the state, we can pull the resources and also divide the cost, better share and allocate actually the obligations that we all have. Uh, as, as the, um, the sponsor, uh, Delegate Ruth said, uh, recycling faces very serious challenges, as all of us know. Uh, technological changes are expensive, but have to be brought to bear if we're gonna be forward thinking. Uh, and we cannot rely on incineration. M moving towards zero waste is gonna be critical. And the holistic approach that the delegate presented, I think is absolutely the most sound way to go. And I do believe that, um, anaerobic digestion and innovative technologies for sorting, composting, materials reuse can all be addressed centrally, or at least in a way that people are contributing jointly so that we make sure that everybody not only shares in the obligation, but also reduces the, the individual jurisdiction's commitment uh, to spending more money. This is a problem that we're facing in the county uh, and will continue to face if we don't uh, take on some additional uh, approaches such as a regional solution. Now I'll conclude, Mr. Chairman, by saying that actually the idea of looking at this issue regionally came about when I was asked to speak at one of the work groups that you convened last year. Uh, I think it really highlights the need across every jurisdiction to find creative ways. So thank you for the time. So oh, it's my fault. It, well, I, I hope, Mr. Chairman, it, it's coincidental with your, <laughs> with your ongoing commitments. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Um, it seems like the other people who have signed up uh, in favor are just written. They're not testifying. Is that right? Yeah. Okay, questions. Uh, Delegate Otto, uh, you've got your hand up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My simple question of mine is, uh, have these jurisdictions signed off that they want to participate in this uh, work group? I'm not sure who the question is to, yes. Delegate. Um, well, I would assume the sponsor, if she had included them in the uh, okay. Um, I, I would, uh, um, I, I know that some, there has been ongoing discussions about that and um, some of the jurisdictions have um, definitely signed on. Um, I, I would ask uh, Steve Lafferty if you know, if you have you know, more recent the, information the, on that. There should be a letter in the file, at least from Anne Arundel County uh, delegate. Uh, and in speaking to Mr. Connor uh, with the County Executive's Office, he has reached out to all of the jurisdictions and none of them have expressed opposition. Okay, well, I'd, I'd like to see their support of it first. and uh, But I do applaud the regional concept and uh, we pool our resources. So we try to do that often in our smaller counties. So. And if I could just add that that the, the work group includes representatives from all those jurisdictions so that they would have a seat at the table and discuss this going forward. Mm -hmm. and Delegate Otto, isn't MES, uh, doesn't MES operate or, or sort of manage a regional effort on midshore? Maybe lower, maybe not lower shore, but I think midshore. Yeah, I think the midshore does. I don't know if Delegate Jacobs would know more about that than I do, but. Uh, okay. Yeah, well, that's regional uh, uh, solid waste uh, handling, mm -hmm. not new to us. Okay, well, uh, it appears that um, all the people who are um, opposed to the bill just have written testimony. They're not testifying. So there appear to be no further questions. Always good to see you, Steve. Uh, Thank you very much, Kumar. And with that, I will end the public hearing on House Bill 1094. And we'll proceed to House Bill 1103, Delegate Wyville.
Thank you, Chairman Barve. Can you hear me? I can see you too. <laughs> oh my, no, not good for you. Um, not a not a good sight to see. Anyhow, Chairman, uh, Vice Chair Stein, honorable members of the ENT committee. Uh, for the record, I am Delegate Weibel and House Bill 1103 kind of asked for the same thing that Delegate Ruth just asked for on a regional basis, but rather it asked for many of those same things to be done on a statewide basis. Um, this bill is an extension of the ENT um, work group this summer on waste reduction and recycling. And several other bills that we heard this session so far have taken the suggestions from that work group and incorporated them into legislation. Uh, three jurisdictions suggested bans on single use plastic. Uh, six suggested adoption of the extended producer responsibility approach and many others suggested the use of composting as a means to reduce landfill waste. Additionally, six jurisdictions suggested enticing manufacturers and processors to locate, their juris to locate in their jurisdictions and provide incentives for emerging technologies such as anaerobic digestion. Also, six jurisdictions suggested regional efforts for technology, recycling, and waste diversion. The latter is the approach taken by this bill. This legislation seeks to extend the work of the work group by creating a task force comprised of government and elected officials and members of private industry in recycling, waste diversion, or related technology. The hope is that this task force will study in greater detail the latest technologies in the processing of solid waste, including but not limited to sorting, bailing, anaerobic digestion, digesters, pelletizing or other refuse derived fuel, gasification, or even waste energy with the ultimate goal of reducing the amount of material that is buried in landfills. In completing their work, it's hoped the task force will consider regional approaches, incentives for private industry to manufacture recyclable products from waste, as well as identify potential funding sources or tax credit programs to make Maryland the leader in the nation when it comes to the elimination of landfill waste. Um, since I had the bill drafted, I've talked with uh, many stakeholders and I will likely have four amendments to the bill. Um, one, Delegate Boyce has expressed an interest in being a co-sponsor, if she still has that interest. Uh, the First Amendment would add her as a co-sponsor. Um, secondly, um, the composition of the task force likely. Yeah, we, we don't do uh, sponsor amendments like that anymore. The speaker. Yeah, that's what I've been told the whole way through this process. So, okay. Um, second is the uh, composition of the task force likely needs to be altered a little bit um, and adding additional materials uh, potentially to the list to be studied. And I, I struggled with this when I was drafting the legislation. Um, as far as time frame for completion, and I don't think the data I have on there is at all realistic, so it would probably be have, have to be extended um, for another year. Um, my hope was to get something back um, prior to uh, next session. Okay. Um, and what I'm, what I'm looking at is, and it's, it's interesting, there was an article in Reuters uh, magazine. Uh, hey, just, you just, know, believe it or not, you've exceeded your time limit here. I thought we had four minutes. Oh, did that? Uh, that, go that was the first two. Minutes? Oh, I'm sorry. Keep going. All right. You're going to add 10 to it? I'm joking. No, I'm not going to do that. Uh, <laughs> so there's actually an article in Reuters this, this month about a young lady in Kenya who got tired of waiting for the government to, to react or respond. So she developed her own manufacturing plant uh, to make bricks out of plastic bags and sand. And they're 10 times stronger than what bricks are out of the existing bricks that are made. So uh, that's what I'm looking for as an outcome of this legislation, and I ask for a favorable report. Hey, do you have the link to that Reuters report? It's pronounced Reuters, by the way. Oh, sorry. Yes, I can send that to you. Okay, terrific. Any questions for uh, Delegate Weivel? No? Okay, that ends the public <laughs> hearing uh, on House Bill 1103. Uh, let's go to the last bill of the day, House Bill 1133, Delegate Bridges. Tony, you in the house? I am here now. Okay, go for it. All right. Hopefully uh, my uh, folks are still here with me as well. Uh, good morning again. Uh, good morning. Good afternoon, uh, members of the Environment and Transportation Committee. Delegate Bridges here for 
House Bill 1133, which is the Urban Trees Program and Commission for the Innovation and Advancement of Carbon Market and Sustainable Tree Plantings, which is a mouthful. Um, this should be very familiar to you. You already heard part of this uh, because it's part of the Climate Solutions Now Act of 2021. Um, and so I wanna thank Delegate Stein and for his work and his partnership on this. This takes a piece of that act and really highlights the work that needs to be done around trees in underserved communities. So while the Climate Solution Act has many elements to it, the goal was to ensure that if for some reason the final bill as it moves doesn't include this portion, we still have a standalone bill that's able to focus on just the tree portion. Um, I do have an amendment that I've submitted for the committee that really changes just the title of the program from an urban tree program to an underserved communities tree program. And I'll explain that in a second. Uh, but the bill also establishes a commission for the innovation and advancement of carbon markets uh, for sustainable tree planting. Lisa McNeely from uh, Baltimore City, who's a director of sustainability, uh, can explain in detail what those tax credits or those credits are all about as well. Um, look, trees and communities do a lot. I grew up in a neighborhood, uh, just thinking back over it, that was super hot during the summer. There, were plenty, there was plenty of like asphalt, uh, black rooftops, but very little trees. And so no one there was hot. We know that trees can provide shade and cooling and lower that effect of heat islands. And we simply just cannot ignore any longer the environmental injustices that affect communities of color and those from low income socioeconomic backgrounds. Uh, neighborhoods with more residents from low income backgrounds are actually hotter than their wealthier counterparts. Uh, so we have to plant trees. They help with health issues. They reduce air and noise pollution at the property value. You all know the benefits of trees in communities. So the goal of this bill is to plant 500,000 trees by the end of calendar year 2030 in underserved communities. And those aren't just in cities, uh, which is why I wanted to change um, and highlight that these are underserved communities. These are communities that are in, um, designated as urban by the US Census Bureau under the authority of a local housing authority. Um, they could be in a neighborhood that was redlined or graded as hazardous by the homeowners, homeowners loan corporation. Um, they can also be in a census tract uh, with high unemployment or a census tract where um, the average rate of unemployment is, uh, or the, it's 75% of the medium household income for the state during that 24 month period uh, for the census tract, which puts this in really many communities throughout the state, not just in urban communities, not just in the city. Uh, again, this is gonna be funded uh, $10 million in fiscal year 2022, through 2030 from the Bay Restoration Fund uh, to, and administered by the Chesapeake Bay Trust. Now I know in the fiscal note, MDE said that it has plans to spend uh, the BRF funding on capital projects, which could delay those projects. But I, I'll say a couple of things to that. One, the purpose of the BRF was to upgrade all of the major wastewater treatment plants. Um, the process has almost been completed. And so I don't think this bill really impacts the funding or the timeline for finishing the job. Two, the funding for the projects really come before the allocation of this legislation. So I know the um, wastewater treatment plants, uh, you know, there are two to four minor plants per year. And so the funding really does for those plants come before the allocation for this legislation. Uh, and, you know, there is now capacity within the BRF for a broader scope of projects to provide societal benefits. So the fact of the matter is communities that this legislation target have just been ignored for too long. Ultimately, it's a question of priorities. And so support for underserved communities needs to be a, a priority. Um, so again, I know you heard this before, so I won't go on and on about the need. I will just ask that if any of the uh, advocates are still here on the call, yeah, they listen are. to them um, and provide us with a favorable report. Yeah, um, okay. Uh, First, Robin Clark, then Lisa McNeely, uh, Jean Braha, Jana Davis, Tomasino, Tomasino Poirot, uh, Angelica Bailey, uh, Patricia Parker, in that order. So let's start with Robin Clark. Robin. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Thank you so much for your attention at this late hour. Um, thank you to the sponsor, Delegate Bridges. He did such a good job of introducing the bill. Um, and I think others after me are going to also speak in more detail. So I would just say a word, I think, on the, the why on urban trees from the perspective of the Chesapeake Bay Foundation. 
and a little bit on the how. And I think others on the call are going to speak to the speak to the other big questions that you might have as a legislator. Um, on the why, trees are an excellent water quality filter in addition to providing all those other benefits the delegate bridges discussed. And while we've done a great job as a state, and I thank you for your support and funding all the things that you funded that are really helping to upgrade those major wastewater treatment plants, um, to fund cover crops from agriculture, the, the, the wonderful thing about trees and, this, and particular trees in developed areas is that they're not only gonna help the bay's water quality, they're gonna help local water quality where folks in, in residential areas might be swimming, they might be fishing and eating the fish. Uh, we can help them at the same time as helping the bay and it's incredibly cost effective. So as far as using the Bay Restoration Fund, it's a wonderful purpose there. And then I would point out that the commission in the bill will help us maximize the water quality benefits and the carbon benefits by developing a planting plan that really maps those areas that will get the most bang for the buck. So with that, I urge your support and appreciate your, your time and attention at this hour. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, next, uh, Lisa McNeely. Sorry, I, for some reason my mouse just decided to stop working, but I found a different way to unmute myself. Good evening, uh, uh, Chairman Barbe, Vice Chair uh, Stein, members of the committee. I'm Lisa McNeely, the Director of Sustainability for the City of Baltimore, here on behalf of the Mayor's Office in support of HB uh, 1133. Um, for many of the reasons that were just outlined by the previous person, um, we this, this urban tree program would be important to the city uh, we have a sustainability plan um, that lays out, has a whole section on trees and forests, and a major strategy is to plant and establish more trees, ensuring a more equitable planting distribution. Uh, we see this program as, as helping us further that along. Uh, we also have greenhouse gas emissions reduction target, um, but, but also more importantly, we have a goal to reduce, uh, to increase our tree canopy coverage to 40%. We see this as important. Um, for uh, the urban heat island effects. We, uh, we, there have been studies where there are parts of the city that are, during a heat wave can be 10 degrees or more hotter than uh, other parts of the city and, and having more funds or more support for including trees um, in those areas would be very welcome. Um, as Delegate Bridges mentioned, the, the tax, the carbon credit uh, aspect of this um, is, is really interesting. There's a, a lot of details to that that I don't have time to, to talk about right now, but one aspect of that that we see as important is that it helps provide an incentive for maintaining these trees. Um, uh, uh, many, car many carbon credit programs are set up such that the incentives or the payments that would come back from that are spread out over time and are dependent upon the trees uh, still being there, still providing those benefits. And so for these reasons, I urge a favorable report on HB 1133. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, let's go to Jean uh, Braha. Jean. Thank you so much, Chairman Barve and, and others. Um, and as you can see, I'm so in support of House Bill 1133 that I brought the trees with me. Um, I'm the Executive Director of Rock Creek Conservancy, and we see this bill as an important step towards reducing inequities in urban tree cover throughout Maryland and as a way to explore a statewide carbon offset market to support more tree plantings and maintenance. I'm delighted to hear other speakers emphasize maintenance. Um, Rock Creek Conservancy is a dedicated voice for Rock Creek. We work with individuals and organizations to restore Rock Creek and its parklands as a natural oasis for all people to appreciate and protect. And we see this bill as helping to support a number of much needed solutions in terms of addressing stormwater management and equity of access to the ecosystem services that Rock Creek can and should provide. Rock Creek and its Stream Valley parks are key drivers of quality of life in Montgomery County. And this bill will help ensure that all of our watershed residents can share more equally in those benefits, bringing park-like conditions closer to each person. We know that in areas east of Rock Creek, which overlap heavily with the identified underserved areas targeted by this bill, they experience greater urban heat island effects and have less green space. The goal of planting 500,000 trees in underserved communities will help Maryland address longstanding inequities like this. And we know that trees capture carbon and deliver a host of other co-benefits, 
Importantly, in the Rock Creek watershed, we've seen many storm, uh, major storm events and see more as climate continues to change. For example, on September 10th of this year, we had a storm that created flooding that endangered people's lives um, and property. This type of program to plant trees and to do the, them in the communities that need these ecosystem services the most could be incredibly beneficial. Um, I also appreciate that this bill specifies that tree planting programs should prioritize sustainable, which are presumably climate resilient and native trees. And we also think this could create a wonderful stimulus for our local nurseries and horticulture uh, organizations so that there are more opportunities for others to voluntarily plant these types of trees. Um, I'll just quickly note that the opportunity for workforce development implicit in this bill as well could create additional co and um, mutually reinforcing benefits to the watershed. So thank you and we encourage a favorable support. Thank you very much. Uh, next, uh, Jana Davis. And Jana, before you start speaking, I want you to know that my new House of Delegates Bay plates are on my car. Great. Thank you. <laughs> if anyone else wants information about that, let me know. Only $20. <laughs> 20 bucks. One tree. <laughs> Not an urban tree, though. Um, <laughs> So Mr. Chairman, Mr. Vice Chairman, Delegate Bridges, members of the committee, everyone else, thank you so much. I'm Jana Davis, Executive Director of the Chesapeake Bay Trust. Um, as with HB 583, of course, the trust role in this bill is to administer the urban tree program. So I'm not gonna repeat the points I made during that hearing, but I just wanna touch on a couple of newish points that seem to be hot topics, demand and maintenance. So, you know, we fund tree planting projects already from a wide number of groups. Um, we have a huge demand for those kinds of projects from all types of entities. Local governments, for example, have adopted tree canopy goals. There's about 100 communities around our state who have adopted tree canopy goals. At the resident level, we get community groups, neighborhood groups. We have a couple that are testifying today from all over the state who want these kinds of projects. Um, homeowner associations, CDCs, neighborhood groups, faith-based groups, et cetera. We can only fund right now about a third of the grant demand. Um, and as you all know, I don't need to repeat it, uh, trees provide a ton of benefits. Delegate Bridges did a good job describing that. Others are going, have already outlined and are going to outline it. So that's the demand piece. The other piece is the maintenance piece. It's a huge topic. We all talk about it. Um, all BMPs that best management practices we put in the ground have maintenance issues. Um, it's possible, of course, to design successful projects that last. So we shouldn't let this uh, be a, a reason for us to be nervous about this. And three factors about this particular program will contribute to their sustainability. First, projects led by communities themselves, which is the model of this program, groups proposing grant projects are more likely to be maintained. They're owned by the community. They're, they're bottom up, not top down. Second, the first phase of maintenance will be supported by this program, the riskiest period for new trees. And third, as Lisa mentioned, we're super excited to explore with delegates Bridges and Stein and others, um, the idea of supporting a maintenance program with these tree credit, um, carbon credit uh, pieces. So. We're excited about this program. It has all those elements. As you all know, the trust is a very efficient organization, four-star charity navigator, which is the highest rating for over 20 years, and 90% of all funds go to programs. So thank you very much. Hey, okay, thank you. Next, um, uh, Thomasina Poirot. Thomasina. Hi. Sorry. <laughs> thank you, Chairman. Uh, thank you to the committee. Um, Thomasina Pro, I'm a lawyer at Venable, um, longtime resident of Baltimore City. And when I moved here, I noticed that there was just a concrete jungle of trees in some of the communities. So um, I decided to get involved. I currently chair the board of the Baltimore Tree Trust. And full disclosure, I'm also on the board of the Chesapeake Bay Trust. Um, but over the last eight years, we've been planting trees in uh, East and West Baltimore, um, and they provide, I've seen firsthand, the social benefits as well as uh, the workforce development benefits. Um, we dropped off buckets in trees. I'll show you a prop. It's getting late at night. Um, and uh, we dropped this off for education purposes. Um, these trees have completely aesthetically transformed uh, these, these neighborhoods. Um, we'll talk about Michelle DeGree's Park right now. Um, eight years ago, we planted trees that were two inches in caliber. They're now up to eight inches in caliber. They're providing shade. The residents have reported that uh, their kids are going out during the summers and running around on their tree-lined streets because they're shade. Uh, the kids in um, the neighboring elementary school have been providing, uh, you know, writing and, and drawing. Trees are terrific. 
So it's been awesome. But the workforce development is the best part of this. We have a workforce development program called the Urban Roots Apprenticeship. We've been working with organizations um, for uh, workforce development, people returning from prison, people you know, in, in these economic areas that need work. Um, and we provide them training, mentoring, um, and uh, hands-on experiences in order to provide them hopeful, hopefully careers in uh, the landscape and food care uh, careers in the future. So um, we have approximately 10 a year, and with your help, we can scale our 3,000 trees per year to 10,000 trees per year and provide a lot of additional jobs. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Tomasina. Next, Angelica Bailey with MML. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Hello again, Angelica Bailey, Director of Government Relations for the Maryland Municipal League. We are here in support of House Bill 1133. I won't reiterate the benefits of trees or the needs of underserved communities. I just want to express our appreciation for the funding and support that this bill provides to local governments. Half a million trees by 2030 is an ambitious goal, but that funding and support makes all the difference for us. And I mentioned previously, climate change is one of MML's strategic initiatives this year. So we are excited for the opportunity to support House Bill 1133. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next, uh, Patricia Parker. Patricia? Can you hear me now? Uh, I can hear you and see you. Wonderful, okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Vice Chairman, and members of the committee, I'm Patricia Hayes Parker, Executive Director uh, for CCAR, Central Kenilworth Avenue Revitalization Community Development Corporation, and we support HB uh, 1133. Uh, why do we support the bill? Uh, it is aligned with our mission to promote the social, environmental, and economic development of Greater Riverdale. We serve a very diverse geographically and ethnically including uh, 12, 12 communities. Uh, the need is great throughout Greater Riverdale um, to add tree cover because our community has undergone a substantial amount of change, including infill housing and suburban type strip shopping centers with impervious paving and large parking lots. So trees are part, should be a part of appropriate development. Again, why equity, additional tree cover will have a positive impact on health and wellness, economics and energy reduction, water quality and climate change. Trees are a part of appropriate development. Minority neighborhoods tend to have higher mortality, morbidity and health risk compared to white neighborhoods due to environmental conditions that play a role in producing and maintaining health disparities. Our history is that we've planted over 800 trees in Greater Riverdale, and we have recently received national attention for this work through the Starbucks Foundation's Neighborhood Grants Program. The impact of the program is not just to the environment, it also provides economic impact. We contract each year with a minority tree company expert in tree planting that hires minority employees. We use local nurseries as vendors and engage college students to assist us to reach out and inform the community. Thank you for this opportunity to offer these comments. Okay, thank you very much. Are there any questions for the sponsor or any of these proponents? Nobody has signed up in opposition. Um, Delegate Healy, you need to unmute yourself. There we go. Uh, and there we go. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I just wanted to uh, to welcome um, Pat Parker uh, and CCAR is this tremendous grassroots organization and or, uh, that has pulled together all these local community organizations to redevelop the area along Kenilworth Avenue, right around where the Purple Line is is going through and. They do tremendous work and I'm very happy to support them and this bill as well. Thank you. Very good then. Any other questions for uh, uh, any of these folks? If not, thank you very much. That ends the public hearing. I, I don't think, yeah, nobody signed up in opposition. That ends the public hearing for House Bill 1133. It also ends the public hearings for today. Uh, announcements from subcommittee chairs. Any subcommittee chair announcements? No? All righty. Well, I want to see my subcommittee. Anybody else have any announcements for the committee? 
No? Okay. Well, it's 523, so I'd like to do our leadership meeting um, at 530 so we can get it uh, over and done with as quickly as possible. So I'll meet with my leaders at 530, and all the rest of you are free to go. Try to behave yourself.